start for a couple minutes yet because it's not quite nine, but we'll be with you shortly. It is Tuesday, July 12th, and this is the P County of Placer Board of Supervisors official meeting. We'll start today with our Pledge of Allegiance led by Karen Schwab, our County Council. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation and under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I am wearing a mask again because my husband has come down with a little bit of COVID. I am still negative, but I'm gonna protect my counterparts up here and any of you in the room, so. Thank you for bearing with me, and hopefully you can hear me through this. Um, we will start with our consent agenda. Are there any items that the board members would like to pull from consent? And I'm seeing others shake their head. Are there any members of the public who would like to address this on a consent calendar item? Not seeing any, um, then I would accept a motion. She's saying none. She, she checked Zoom, right? Yes. Yeah. I'll second. Holmes and Gore, and this is a roll call vote. Megan, will you call the roll? Gore? Wygan is absent. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Okay, and we're gonna start our public comment today uh, and move to that item. I wanted to call up Christine Faria. Is that, did I get it right, Christine? Uh, from Assembly Member Kylie's office. Um, she is going to be presenting a proclamation to us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gustafson, and good morning, members of the board. Um, as um, mentioned, my name is Christina Faria, and I am so excited to be here on behalf of Assemblyman Kevin Kiley this morning to present you all with an assembly resolution. Um, as you may recall, a few months ago, the Sacramento Bee published an article uh, discussing Placer County's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the article raised the question as to how the county's approach worked out for the county. And so I'd like to highlight just a few uh, points that were made in that article. 
Uh, Placer County's per capita COVID-19 death rate through the pandemic was about two thirds that of the state average. Placer led the region in vaccinations with the highest vaccination rate per capita in the region. Placer County led the state in recommending N95 masks over the cloth masks. Placer County was among the first in 2020 to distinguish on its dashboard the difference between hospitalizations because of COVID and with COVID. Uh, the federal government didn't take that step until early 2022. And then Placer County was one of just four California counties to add residents in 2020 when the state's overall population fell. So to the question of whether Placer County's approach worked out, the answer is a resounding yes. And as we leave the pandemic behind us, we wanted to take a moment to recognize the Board of Supervisors for your exceptional governance and collaboration within the community. The decisions that you have made over the last two and a half years have not been easy. They've not always been popular, but we know that your actions as a board have undoubtedly protected our quality of life and have made all of us proud to call Placer County our home. So on behalf of Assemblyman Kevin Kiley in the California State Assembly, I am pleased to present you all with this resolution in honor of your outstanding leadership. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, any other public comment for us this morning? These are on items that are not on our agenda and we limit those to three minutes each. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, um, my name is Jennifer and I'm from Placer County. Um, I just wanna kind of take a count of events that are happening around the world right now. Um, right now in Holland, uh, the government decided to close down 30% of the farms or ask citizens to voluntarily cull their animals or close their farms down, which resulted in holding off um, the borders. Um, the fire department has joined with them. There's a huge protest there right now. I don't think anybody knows about Germany where they um, hold space that the borders have joined in as well. Um, they actually produce about 40% of food, I guess, for Europe in that area. So I just like to point out that the food is going to be disrupted for sure that way. Either late last night or this morning, um, our neighbors to the north, Canada, they decided that they're going to reduce their fertilizer usage by 30% by 2025 for the 2030 plan. So I think that's pretty significant since they're our neighbors and they will be producing less food. So my question always is, what are we doing here in Placer County to protect the citizens of Placer County? Because a lot of crops aren't being planted on time this year. A lot of crops aren't going to be planted at all. Food prices will go up because as um, we start with the new baby cows or chickens, the feed is more expensive. So next year, food's gonna be very, very expensive. Also, California passed a bill, and I can't remember the, the number, but it's for independent truckers not being allowed to operate unless they are part of a uh, huge company. So many independent truckers are leaving California and they're saying they're not gonna come back and do any trucking here as a result. 
So we may be losing a large part of our trucking industry to bring food back and forth uh, to places. We do have a very large agricultural area here in Placer County, and again, I'm asking what are we doing to make sure they're being supported because we could actually feed a large part of our county. Also in Holland, um, the government was shooting at the farmers who were unarmed, and I do think we need to revisit becoming a gun sanctuary county here because without guns, the government will come in and just take. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Do we have others in the room here who would like to address this under public comment? Are there any on Zoom? Michael, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Ian, uh, for speaking for Placer County tomorrow. I, I'm going to introduce a topic with a few brief words, and that topic has to do with the county's newspaper monopoly. Uh, and it's not just the problem that it's a monopoly. The problem is, is that it doesn't cover, quote, political, unquote, things. That's what has been explained to me. And uh, we have a, a public that is largely uninformed about the massive development that's taking place in this county and what the government is doing. The government participation is very low. Uh, there was a good example just before me of government par participation, but in general, the public has no way of knowing about the major things the county is doing. I don't know what the remedy is to the BREM media problem we have, but I think it's something we need to start talking about. It is like uh, my mom came from the, the east side of Nevada and I've gone back to look at the newspapers there from the several generations of the Wiseman family that were there in Clover Valley, south of Wells. And those newspapers were robust and they had uh, social comments on the different neighborhoods, the different areas, like uh, the valley uh, my family was from, that side of my family was from. But we have a newspapers that are basically a very large version of those old social columns. And we need uh, we need newspapers, we need some kind of uh, media that covers what you are doing. And hopefully we can have some, begin some commentary and bring that about. Thanks for this opportunity to express this. Thank you, Michael. Are there any other public comments for us this morning? I see none on Zoom. Okay, so with that, we'll close our public comment and move to board member and county executive reports. Uh, board members, do you have, yes, Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Chair, Chair Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, really pleased to announce uh, that the Department of Agriculture has started a um, Wildland Fire Mitigation and Management Commission, which is a nationwide organization. And I'm very pleased to announce that Andy Fecco, the executive director of Placer County Water Agency has been appointed to that, um, a very prestigious position. And Andy is really knows what, it, what, it, what he's doing as far as um, water issues and drought, all those kinds of things, and what we need to do as far as protecting our national forests. And so I'm really pleased and excited for him. I personally made a, a point of uh, recommending him uh, the uh, rural county representatives of California, RCRC, also had an application in for uh, one of our members, uh, but apparently Andy was uh, got the position. So really pleased to uh, work with Andy. I work with, uh, with along with Supervisor Wygant on the uh, Middle Fork Finance Authority. I have a great relationship with Andy, so I wish him well and look forward to more improvements for our California and national forests. Thank you. Thank you, that's great news. Great to have a Placer County representative nationwide. Other board member reports? 
I'll, uh, I'll provide one. I think uh, many of our residents hopefully saw that U.S. News and World Report's health statistics came out, and Placer County was ranked third in the state as healthiest communities and 40th in the nation. So really outstanding results for our county residents, not only what Placer County does to support that, but also what residents do to support each other in our communities. So great statistics there. And one other announcement is that uh, we were successful in getting um, our state officials to put $8 million in the budget uh, for cleanup of the American uh, River Canyon. Uh, we worked with PARC to get the bridge debris um, funding from Caltrans and Placer County will take the lead in removing that debris out of the canyon. So it's been, uh, I think 40 or 50 years been waiting to get that debris out of the river. So that's great news. Look forward to hearing about that project as we move forward. Jane, did you have a CEO report? Certainly, thank you, Board Chair. Um, just a bit of an update on two homeless fronts, uh, both in terms of what's going on at our Placer County Government Center, as well as the Regional Homelessness Planning Group, which I'll take on first. The work of the Regional Task Force continues with phase two of its meeting on Wednesday, June 29th. The regional representatives, which include not only Placer County, but all of our cities, reviewed the progress made during the phase one, including securing additional funding for the Hampton Inn permanent supportive housing project, documenting a decreased rate of homelessness across the county since 2020, and continuing to connect more individuals to services and housing through the service center at the Placer County Government Center, as well as additional outreach efforts. The project consultants reviewed the progress to date, objectives for phase two, and planning team members discussed priorities for the next seven months of this effort. The planning team will be convening monthly, with the next meeting scheduled for August 3rd with technical groups continuing to meet in the interim. At our Placer County Government Center, just a bit of update for our viewing public and our community, the homeless liaison team continues to engage with campers, encouraging them to seek shelter and services through the newly established HHS Service Center. The center had approximately 75 campers in June with progressively increased use throughout the month, largely due to community policing and engagement methods deployed by probation and other on-site staff. As of Friday, July 8th, the homeless campers at PCGC numbered approximately 28. However, the number of tents on the 1st and F Street site numbered 66, just under 2.5 mostly family-sized tents per camper. So uh, despite our recommended campsites, campers continue to amass items such as couches, tables, chairs, mattresses, and other large items that well exceed the footprint for camping sites. Staff continue to monitor the site and encourage campers to engage with staff at the service center for needed services. Cal Fire and our Placer County Fire Marshal assessed the site in response to community concerns and recommended changes to the site, including adjustments to the fences to allow ADA access moving parking boulders, creating an access lane, and affirms there are no additional issues for the site with regard to emergency vehicle access. So staff continues to work with campers to, impl imp I'm sorry, to implement these modifications and keep the camp safe, both for campers and adjacent neighborhoods. Thank you. Any questions, board members, to Jane's report? Great, thank you, Jane. Um, then we'll move on now. Uh, we're a little early for our timed item at 9.20, so we'll, uh, I see our auditor back there in the back. Um, Andy, if you'd come up, we'd talk about the interest-bearing loans from traffic mitigation fee funds. Good morning, Chairwoman Gustafson, <coughs> members of the board, Jane and Karen. Andy Sisk, your auditor controller. I'm here today to ask uh, the board, I'm gonna introduce an ordinance and waive oral reading modifying county code chapter 15 article 15.28 section 15.28030p to include interest bearing loans between lending fee districts so first i'll start off that specifically this item is focusing on the traffic mitigation fee program however as the board's probably aware we have a number of fee programs in the county capital facility fees park dedication fees affordable housing fees to name a few Sometimes these fee programs also require you to keep track of these 
uh, fee programs by jurisdiction, by area of the county. And so with the traffic mitigation fee program, uh, the auditor controller a number of years ago set up funds to account for 11 fee districts that deal with traffic mitigation fees. I thought I, instead of boring you with government code, would talk about accounting principles because all this deals with fund accounting, which goes to accounting principle two. And I know recently I've been talking about accounting standards 100. I'm going way back to the beginning, which is fund accounting. And fund accounting is what drives government and nonprofit organizations. Why? Because these organizations rely on revenue from multiple sources, and they're often confronted with restrictions on how those funds are allocated and spent. Now I'm going to read to you a quick definition of what is a fund, and I'm going to break it out into five components, and this is actually something I teach in the Introduction to Governmental Accounting class. What is a fund? Why do we have a fund in accounting? First, a fund is a fiscal and accounting entity. So right there, if you think of the county of Placer as a big company, you have a number of funds, which are almost like subsidiaries of a big company. They're self-balancing. What does that mean? Well, your assets must equal your liabilities plus equity. You also have to account for the changes in operations that ensures that the fund is going to be balanced. Funds are segregated for specific purposes with special regulations, restrictions, and limitations. And that's what you're talking about with these types of fee programs. There are purpose restrictions associated with these monies, and that is why we alloc put them in separate funds. This then gets to an important part of what we do in the auditor's office, which then ties into the treasurer tax collector's office. All of these funds are in a pool. Why are they in the treasurer's pool? To maximize interest earnings, but some of the people in the pool have no choice, like school districts. They must keep their money in the county treasury. Again, to maximize in investment earnings, some, of course, are mandated to do that, but it's important to understand the treasurer's role is to maintain safety, liquidity, and yield, and also to allocate and monthly apportion interest to all these different funds. So this gets in and ties into Government Code 66006, which basically states that all these fee programs in various pockets of the county must be maintained in a fund, and there must be an accounting of the fees collected and the associated interest earned in these funds. Currently, these funds uh, are not uh, are being borrowed from, but we're not repaying those funds back with interest that, that's been borrowed. So my recommendation is that we, going forward, allocate, we make sure that any loans that are borrowed from these types of fee programs that they're repaid back with interest. I know there will be a small impact to the road fund that is borrowing these monies to get projects accomplished throughout Placer County. I think it's a small dent in their fund. Uh, I think the latest I saw in terms of the treasurer's pooled rate is 0.42%. Uh, I know Janine's doing the best she can with the limitations of government code to maximize interest earnings, uh, but we're in some tough times right now in terms of uh, our investment yield. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you so much, Andy. Board members, yes, Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Chair Gustafson. So over the years, uh, when there's a pro uh, road project that maybe has a shortfall from their funds in their little area, it's been a tradition to borrow those from another district. Correct. And was this when uh, the Harriet Ex White Expressway was uh, improved, was that kind of the genesis of that where Several dollars were taken out in different funds? Yeah, the first loans that were made were back with the Bell Road Widening Project. Yeah. Um, and when we did that project, funds were borrowed from different pockets yeah. of these fee districts, and interest would repay back into those fee districts. Okay, so we're just making sure that that is continued or started again. Correct. All right, good, thank you. If there's future borrowings. Right, if there's future borrowings. Thank you. Supervisor Jones. Yes, hi Andy, how are you? Um, I do have questions. The, um, so you said that the interest rate now is 0.42 percent? Through, through May 31st, 2022. Okay, do you expect it to go up? If it goes up, it might go up to 0.5 percent, but you know, it might go down a little bit because I know June was still a little bit of a rocky month uh, at the market. Okay, um, so 
I was trying to get a, a better grasp on the concept here. We have 11 fee districts, but who's our biggest borrower, would you say? It, well, right now it's the road fund that's borrowing from these traffic mitigation fees to do various projects throughout the county. Right. Some of those projects, Auburn Folsom Road Widening Project, the Kings Beach Commercial Core Project, to name a couple. Right. So I did speak to Public Works, and it's kind of a dilemma, I think, because there's a lot of money. How much money do you think are in these total fund accounts? I don't know off the top of my head, but it's typically somewhere between 20 and 30 million, 30 million. and that's a combination of all the different right, regions in the county. Right, okay. So in the instance where we have a need to widen or do a road improvement like like Auburn Folsom Road, that was a pretty big project. Um, if, if we have to wait and delay, doesn't that end up costing us more to, to do the work? If we delay the project? Yeah, if we delay the project. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely cost escalators with construction costs and so right. forth, yes. Right, so I'm, I'm thinking, for me, it's kind of a question of do we go ahead and move forward and get the work done before the costs escalate? at the risk of not being able to pay the interest, you know. Um, I also, my understanding is, does the public works, do they repay some of the loans with interest or do they never pay? At, currently they are not repaying those loans back with interest. Okay, they've never paid any back with They them. did pay interest back on their Bell Road widening project. Ah, okay. So and I should also, not to interrupt you, but there have been a number of sewer loans as well and the sewer loans have all been repaid back with interest as well. Okay, so my question then is, how does he recover the money to pay back the loan? Where does the money come from? So it could come from a variety of sources. It depends on the funding source that's gonna repay back uh, the loan. Like Caltrans? Uh, so in the instance of Caltrans, well Caltrans is not gonna reimburse you for interest. Okay, Correct. so in that situation, it would have to be the road fund that would pay the interest on that loan. Just like if they were to borrow from any other outside party, they would right. have to pay interest on the loan. Right. I think, though, that our improving our roadways in Placer County is probably one of our gr biggest issues. I mean, we've, our population is growing and growing and growing, and nothing is happening with our roadways. You know, so I mean, do we limit the ability to do road improvements if we require that they repay the loan with interest? Because in the instance if Caltrans is it's a Caltrans grant or it's a state grant, they don't pay back with interest. They just reimburse for the grant That's money. Correct. So where does the money for the loan for the interest have to come from? Will it come out of the general fund? Will it come out of the road fund and it should and this is why I talked about fund accounting at the beginning, the road fund is also allocated interest from the treasurer's pool. So they're earning interest on the monies that they have uh -huh. in terms of cash on hand. So they should be paying interest on these loans. And if the road fund doesn't have enough money to pay interest, then yes, mm -hmm. I guess the default would be the general fund, unless we're talking about something like the tier two fee program that's administered by Sparta, maybe mm -hmm. Sparta would reimburse us for that interest. Uh, again, we have a number of funding sources that are repaying back these loans. Right. And so it all depends on the funding source. But definitely grantors are not right. going to pay for interest. So is it realistic, though, to expect Sparta to pay us back for interest? It's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, mean, I, I kind and, of is And maybe honest. I can clarify, because I think it's easier if we use examples. So, so say the fees are collected for road improvements that are needed in Granite Bay and they go to road improvements in Auburn, you'd want your money back with interest to make sure the roads in your district got improved. And so you'd want the Auburn, even though they, their project went first and was less expensive because they were able to get it first, you'd want your money back with interest to make sure your, the projects in your district got done. Is that a, that is, a fair analogy? Because yes, I yes. think that helps. I mean, I understand DPW's concern that they're going to have to pay back interest, but it's only fair to the rate payers who are fee payers in those districts to get their money back with, I mean, it's a piddly amount of yeah. interest right now, yeah. but 
um, but at least we're trying to right. keep that and we're then abiding by these accounting codes that we should be following so uh, that helped me understand it better Suzanne right right well my concern is that it creates an issue with our ability to do road work if they can't borrow money based on the fact that they have to repay pay the interest mm -hmm. and if they can't repay the interest does it end up coming out of the taxpayers comes out of future fees that are paid right or, i believe but it yes. could come from the general fund or other sources it, it's possible possible it's possible okay. That would be a board decision yes, if we right. if we took general fund money right. money. The road fund is funded with these fees. So may I may I ask a question mm -hmm. as well? Um, Andy, yes. what's the, the typical accounting practice for other counties as far as situations like this and borrowing from one fund to pay for a project in another area? Well, traditionally any type of borrowing has an interest component. You rarely see non-interest bearing loans. You just don't see it out in the marketplace. Um, now, yes, now maybe there's some car dealers out there that will say 0% APR for four years, um, <laughs> but they're trying to entice you to buy a vehicle. Uh, we're in government. And so I can tell you all my colleagues keep all their funds the same way I keep my funds and they allocate interest unless laws specifically state the interest goes to the general fund. And we do have some of those funds like that. Uh, like our unapportioned collections property tax fund all the interest in that fund goes to the general fund mm -hmm. okay. so it's I mean it, it sounds like what you're really asking us is to do is make a best practice this is something that we do regularly and my understanding too for funds like this money comes in regularly whether it's from the general fund whether it's from sales tax from the state money comes into our road fund and we get it on a regular basis so if we have to borrow from another fund to forward fund a project money is still going to come into that fund which then can repay um, a different fund with interest i mean it's not like these funds are one time only our road fund is getting money in it regularly because we're always maintaining maintaining our roads well it, it it was my understanding karen you correct me if i'm wrong but that have have we always required the loans to be paid back with interest i know the accounts are are interest bearing even though at 0.42 percent but is it possible for them to borrow money from the account and not pay it back without interest has it happened in the county i mean that's what are, been are you asking in the past yeah. because if you're asking in the past i think that's why the auditors brought this this code amendment is to codify that it should be interest bearing loans and while it might be 4.42 percent today maybe three four five years ago it might have been two two and a half percent and so these various regions in the county are losing out on that interest earnings because they have loaned money from one pocket of the county to another and they're not getting repaid back that interest that they've lost and so that's to the detriment of projects in that region in my opinion yeah well i guess it's because when we get grants from the government they don't pay back with interest they just give you a grant of x dollars well it, let's clarify here grants are completely different well i mean they're building they're borrowing the money to build the road because they're expecting to get the grant to repay right but a grant program is completely different than a loan program right. so i don't think we should should mix the two together a grant when a grant is given there are certain terms to the grant and that's what you comply with it's not you, you rare i don't think i've ever seen a grant that says we're giving you the money but we're charging interest for it um versus a loan program what the auditor is proposing here is is best practices in terms of if you're loaning between the funds then you should be charging interest on that loan so two completely different things no i'm talking about the the grants that they're getting for the highway or roadway work you know they they borrow the money up front to do the work and then they get a grant from the state or caltrans to pay for that work and that grant so i guess they probably shouldn't borrow any more money than the grant is going to be so that will include their interest i see my my concern is that will it hold up any of our roadway work construction if they have to pay back the loan with interest when they haven't done it all the time in the past i mean it's been somewhat mm -hmm. of a practice mm -hmm. 
So that's kind of my concern. Well, and I, I think we all share the concern of getting work done as quickly as we can, but right. making sure it's done according to county and, and government accounting standards. And it seems like that minimal amount of interest is not going to stop our project. Um, and in fact, help the next project get going because you're, it's all staying in the road fund. It's paying interest to another area's road fund. So to give you a full accounting, as of the end of the fiscal year, we got about $8.3 million outstanding in these loans. The biggest loan on the book still is the Placer Parkway loan, which is going to be repaid back with Tier 2 fees. Now, whether those Tier 2 fees will be paid back with interest in Sparta, that's something that Ken can talk to the executive director about at ECTPA. The remaining loans that are still on the books are about $3 million. And again, 0.42% on $3 million. Again, I'm taking this prospectively. I don't think you're talking big dollars here. I really don't. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Any other questions? Okay, any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any in the audience rushing to the microphone. None on Zoom. And none on Zoom. Okay, then I'd accept a motion to approve this. Thank you, Supervisor Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Okay, we're going to move now to our 920 time to item and receive a report on the Older Adult Advisory Commission and the work they've been doing with the um, all volunteer board that they have. We really appreciate all the hard work that goes in from the commission every year. Good morning, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. My name is Colby Hightoff and I'm a program manager with Health and Human Services Adult System of Care and uh, staff to the Older Adult Advisory Commission. It has been my pleasure to serve you this year supporting the fine work of the commission to improve the lives of older adults and people with disabilities in the community. I want to introduce you to the new commission chair, Russell Loop. Mr. Loop and I have worked together for several years and he is a champion of older adult issues. Mr. Loop graciously volunteers his time to raise awareness of the challenges older adults face and bring about positive change. Mr. Loop is here today to present to you the Older Adult Advisory Commission's annual report for 2021-22. Before I turn it over to Mr. Loop, I'd like to highlight a notable accomplishment with your board. You may recall the Placer County five-year plan to meet the needs of a growing senior population uh, concluded in August of last year. With a letter of support from your board, Health and Human Services shared the work done on the five-year plan with the American Association of Retired Persons, also known as AARP. And we applied to join the AARP network of age-friendly communities and states. I'm happy to report that on February 11th of this year, Placer County was approved to join the network alongside a handful of other California counties and numerous cities, including the city of Roseville. Joining the AARP network as an age-friendly county reflects our commitment to promoting, creating, and sustaining an environment that gives residents of all ages an opportunity to live rewarding, productive, and safe lives. And with that, I turn it over to Mr. Loop to present the Commission's annual report. Good morning. Good morning. To address the board. Thank you, Colby, for your kind words. I've had the honor of working with him for a few years, and. We have been sitting with the Placer County Older Adult Advisory Commission, which I will refer to as Commission. My qualifications involve the spirit of volunteerism, large company management, and as a senior myself, just wanted to help the older population move forward. Our annual report called out 107,000 older adults in Placer County. The growth of the 65 to 85 segment in the U.S. grew in the last interest report 37.5 percent. Our commission strives to represent this older age group that's eight times larger than the growth rate for those under 60. There are a lot more of them coming, that's all I can say. <laughs> These baby boomers are retiring daily and occupy many senior specific 55 plus lodging centers throughout Rockland, Roseville, Lincoln, Auburn, and other areas of the county. 
Our monthly meetings address the overall problems and health concerns of these seniors, plus the real estate matters regarding their current housing situation. With the high median prices for single homes and the extremely high rental rates, it is very hard to obtain a place for them to live. In the last few weeks, the increase in interest rates have added a lot to this. Placer County median home prices now for a typical three or four bedroom home is $775,000. The median rental rate for a similar is $2,950. These senior adults with limited incomes, it's tough, very tough. To address these needs and interests, we work toward providing opportunities for them to work, volunteer, learn, and mentor others. They have a lot of experience to offer. We get them to participate in the community planning and events. By seeking and obtaining their participation, we can oversee activities that will promote the physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Our annual report indicates our involvement in many organizational, legislational, educational, and needs assessment activities. We strive to advocate for these older adults through participation in these local groups and committees. Our focus involves housing, transportation, communication and information, and the community and health information. For fiscal year 2022-23, the Commission has shifted its focus and reportable goals toward implementation of the California Master Plan for Aging. As Chair of the Older Adult Advisory Commission, I participate on the Placer Needs Assessment Steering Committee for the Agency on Aging Area 4. This is a joint project with the Placer Adult Disability Resource Connection. The Commission will be using the Master Plan for Aging Local Playbook in 2022-2023 as a structure and guide for the implementation of the goals in Placer County. This Master Plan for Aging Playbook calls for and supports building housing for all ages, improving access to health services, providing inclusive opportunities for older adults to live and work without fear of abuse and neglect, bolstering the caregiver workforce, and increasing the economic security for the aging Californians. In short, we're gonna be busy. In summation, these are very lofty goals, but with the help of our volunteers and seasoned personnel, we will continue to pursue and achieve them. We offer the report for 2021 and 2022 for our record of accomplishments for your acceptance. I can take some questions if you have any, some comments. Thank you, Mr. Loop, and thank you to the whole group. Uh, what a tremendous job you do for our community and our constituents. Um, well, I will pass that on to all the members of the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Holmes. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, because I, I think I'm um, a member of the Older Adult Advisory Commission, <laughs> the board's representative. Um, I know uh, as, we, as we age, uh, the issue of transportation becomes quite a, quite a problem. What can we do as the board to help uh, transportation for seniors that have lost their ability to drive or uh, can't afford to have a car? Is there anything this board can do to help facilitate that? I would suggest the support of the board and anything that we can come up with. Okay. Uh, we have individual members that are more or less assigned little projects and they go out and do different things. They come back with reports and from there, we, we can move forward with what the suggestions might need to be. But if there's something that I think the board could support, I will be first on the line to stand at the podium for public comment. All righty. We're also, uh, I'm also on the Placer County Transportation Planning Commission as well as Supervisor uh, Jones. So uh, I know we're working on those issues in the uh, PCTPA as well. So thank you for your report, very thorough. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. I just wanted to say thank you both and uh, 
I enjoyed my time on the on the I commission know. and uh, we've sat next to each other a few times. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good good job, excellent job. Let us know what we can do to assist. All right, thank you. Right. Any other comments? Any public comment on this item? Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Um, I just had a question about the AARP um, affiliation. I don't know if you've looked into also AMAC possibly to do any affiliations with them um, just as a secondary place maybe to get resources and, and things like that. So thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment here in the room? Any public comment on Zoom? I was just going to add one comment because I got a news feed that uh, the World Atlas came out with the top 14 small communities in California to retire to, and Auburn was number one. Just right. So they're continuing to encourage those folks, and we have some challenges, but it's a great community to. Many challenges. Start. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thanks again. And uh, why don't we get a photo if Supervisor Holmes and Jones want to go down and join, and we'll do a photo. Well, you're on the, yeah. Uh, we can all go, or we can. Thank you so much again. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll move to our 9.30 timed item. This is the Placer County Visitors Bureau 2022-2024 Contract for Professional Services. And Gloria Stearns, our Economic Development Manager, and Rob Haswell will be presenting this item. Good morning, everybody. Today I have the pleasure of introducing another one of our economic development partners, the Placer County Visitors Bureau. It's important to note that the Visitors Bureau will be working very closely with our department over the next two years, especially on issues of branding and marketing. Our department is also expecting the Visitors Bureau to help us showcase the quality of life when businesses are considering locating in Placer. Our department will also have the Visitors Bureau help when we promote our film office which facilitates commercials, print ads, as well as films. We're already working with the Visitors Bureau as we start to plan some big events for 2023. Today we have their CEO, Rob Haswell, here to provide the annual report before your board considers a budget amendment. Rob? Thank you, Gloria. Madam Chair, esteemed board members and staff, good morning. Thanks for uh, having me here today and hearing my item. Uh, super excited. I, um, as we look forward for the next couple of years, uh, I just think uh, this is one of the best times to be living in one of the great counties uh, in the country. So really excited. Let's hope I don't screw the clicker up. Megan, can you, is it up or which one? <laughs> Not the bottom one, Ron. That's the only thing. So there's this. Okay, good. I didn't want to hit the next one because then we roll the video. So, <laughs> um, and I did, we did put together a video because, you know, one of our jobs, obviously, um, promoting tourism in, in Placer County, um, we are one of the most spectacular places on earth. And so I, I really believe that, um, you know, the videos show a lot better than, than I can tell. So. Uh, on that note, we will uh, debut the world debut of our uh, report, our annual report video. So here we go.
This is Placer, a county as varied and vibrant as any you'll find in the Golden State. Wine country, gold country, lake country. Small town shopping mecca. It's all packed into 1,400 square miles of geography that still offers room to roam. Visit Placer's challenge was to render this remarkable landscape in all its grandeur. To show off the spectacular spots within the county, whether they be miles down a dirt road or seconds off the interstate, a powerful new brand, Life at its Peak, became an anthem for visitors, business owners, and locals alike. With a refreshed look, the brand was launched to the public, driving tourism and economic development by highlighting the local quality of life. In 2020, the world was rocked by a global pandemic. COVID brought travel to a virtual standstill. Visit Placer shifted focus and dedicated resources locally, creating a travel responsibly video, a COVID resource page, and launching Placer County's Shop Placer campaign. Then, as the world began to reopen, and visitors craved the outdoors and small town experiences, the Find Your Place in Placer campaign took travelers deeper into the county to experience the magic of off the beaten path Placer. Compellingly visual and activated through dynamic social media ads, it exposed visitors to a whole new side of Placer. A mapping tool leveraging Google's best in breed technology guided travelers to Placer County's unique businesses and locations of interest. Finally, experience Placer like a local brought the knowledge of lifelong residents to the fingertips of visitors. The results were astounding. Trip planners flooded visitplacer.com with more than half a million website sessions. Web traffic more than doubled in key drive markets around Sacramento and website visitation from longer haul destinations boomed. More than 70 pieces of media coverage generated readership of 83.6 million viewers. A men's journal article listed a Placer County trail as one of the 15 best running trails in America. Travel spending surged with lodging and dining up 20% and arts, entertainment and recreation spending increasing 33%. In total, $1.3 billion of travel-related spending poured into the county in 2021, generating almost 14,000 jobs and $111 million in state and local tax revenue. Visit Placer's leadership and sustainable tourism messaging urged visitors to explore beyond highly popular destinations like North Lake Tahoe, spreading visitation to lesser-known sites and adventures. Telling the story of an entire county is both a challenge and an opportunity by leveraging an experiential visitor center in Auburn and harnessing leading edge technology, powerful creativity, and the spirit of this incomparable county. Visit Placer is building a robust engine for economic vibrancy. There's more work to do, more incredible corners to explore, more stories to tell and Visit Placer is looking forward to showcasing and championing this vibrant county for years to come. All right. Yeah, there it is. So. Yeah, right? That's our backyard. You, you mean know, if, we, if we get out of here, we can go? Yeah. Okay. That's like, you know, we go, I go out and, and I've been doing quite a bit of speaking and I'm always so excited to be able to say that, right? Like this is our backyard. Yeah. You know, and and that is what really excites me about, you know, the extended and new uh, partnership that we're going to have more with uh, economic development, because what we're really, really doing here is um, championing the Placer County quality of life, which our visitors love, our residents love, businesses are really coming to it. So it's very exciting times for me. Give you guys a quick uh, overview of what we do. Uh, we are the uh, destination marketing organism, uh, organization for the county, other than Tahoe has, has got, they take care of the great international destination that it is. Um, we call them destination marketing organization, but they're really more about destination management now, which gets into a lot of that sustainability. We have uh, the Welcome Center in Auburn, one of only 21 in the state of California. 
which is great because when you're driving through the state and you see the blue signs that say welcome center only uh, the uh, sanctioned visit California centers get that so it's super cool um, I don't know some of you might have been at our well, well let's move forward some of you might have come to our open house uh, where uh, our partner visit California came to really talk about the value add that they bring uh, we talked about it as well with um, you know with our partner organizations it was a very partner oriented uh, event um, because we really believe that um, you know this whole mission works a lot better if there's a lot of collaboration and so letting folks know what we do there versus the other and if you haven't been in you should supervisor jones i i know it's upon me i've got to get you up there uh, we were almost did it but uh some things came up so we'll do that for sure but it's really it's really a cool place and and we recently got a grant uh just got accepted a grant uh to do some uh, some new uh, innovations to the to the center to make it more experiential so we're actually partnering with the plaster museums uh, division to uh, to do some stuff to make that even more of a jumping off point than it is already for visitors so super excited um, our board all good organizations start with great boards a few of them are here um, uh, our board president Cherry Spriggs is here uh, Aldo Paneshi Jocelyn Maddox and uh, the person that really makes this place run, the marketing director, uh, Tiffany McKenzie, she's here as well. So I, we have a fantastic board and we, we, we have folks from all over the region um, representing all the crucial seg uh, sectors that we represent. So super good. So this gets, the video got into this a little bit. Uh, Pre-pandemic, you can see we were about a $1.5 billion industry. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, that, that's a huge sector, really. And um, uh, we obviously cratered in 2020, as did everybody else in the world. Uh, uh, the travel hospitality sector probably got hit worse than literally any other sector in, in, in you know, in the world. Uh, but the good news is, as we said, as you saw, we, we are actually bouncing back at a higher pace, faster than a lot of our um, cohorts. Um, you know, we got back to about 1.25 billion, still a little short, right? And, and so we want to really be aggressive as far as that goes. Um, you can see some of the things that are, uh, that are challenges um, ahead, uh, recession threats, fuel costs, inflation. These are all things that I think we all know um, are, are looming potentially. And so it's an important time to invest is, is the message that I'm uh, really putting forward here because we are really positioned in a way uh, to capitalize on a post-pandemic world when a lot of people discovered us uh, because of our amazing outdoors. Um, so uh, we're in good position. Just another graphic uh, that tells you sort of you can see the big bang down and then we came up. So, you know, obviously the goal is to get back up to pre-pandemic spending um, and hopefully we will and I'm confident we will is obviously that creates jobs and helps us raise taxes for infrastructure improvements, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a little hard to read, but I couldn't stand three slides in a row with no color. So I, I decided to overlay this over a nice picture of, uh, of um, Roseville. Yep, and I think I might have even sent this to you as a Zoom background, Bonnie, uh, a few years ago. Yeah, it's a beautiful shot. But you can see we've been really heavy on uh, uh, social media, really making a lot of, uh, of strides forward there. A um, lot of media placements. Uh, again, Hidden Falls, uh, considered one of the best 15 running uh, trails in America by Men's uh, Journal. Super big win for us. I mean, and deserve, well deserved. And, and honestly, we have so many hundreds of others. Uh, that it could, they could have picked some other ones as well. Obviously, Placer Lifestyle, that's what we're selling, right? Top of the class. Um, I like my figures better than the ones you had, Cindy. They, <laughs> I, that was last year's. <laughs> I know, I know. I did, I did, yeah, yeah, but we're going to stick in a The only it. thing that brought us down was housing costs. Oh, is that what it was? It, right. That's the only metric that really dropped us. Well, and we did hear that. Uh, yeah. What, yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. But again, 
Uh, health, health is really something that people um, are looking for when they move to an area, um, and we're, we've got that in spades. Um, and that, in, that me, and that you don't have to actually sail to uh, appreciate that. Uh, obviously, we're, when we talk about lifestyle, we're talking about our great food, our great wine. Um, you know, uh, you see there that, uh, a fun fact, 75 farmers markets, but uh, recently had a chat with Joanne Neft, who uh, filled me in that we actually have 84. So she would know a lot more than me. Um, but again, this is, uh, you know, when you talk about lifestyle, this is the kind of things that we're talking about. Uh, Roseville, top 50 place to live in America, 2020. Top 10 to retire. We hear that uh, Auburn, you know, one of the top places to retire. Uh, Rockland is also a top 50. We just, you know, our towns are amazing, right, to live in. So as we segue, sorry, as we segue towards some of the new scope, um, one of the things you'll see, and uh, talking to uh, Gloria and her staff, uh, what you're seeing right now as businesses site selectors start to look at places is that quality of life has risen dramatically on the factors that matter. Uh, I found it really wild if, you know, as, as early as, as recent as like 2008, quality of life was down in the ten, below 10th. So um, things have really changed, you know, people really are looking uh, for it. And you can see this uh, corporate site selectors value it at that level. On the flip side, um, Millennials that make up, you know, 50% of the workforce, uh, they literally most of the time like to, they'll choose the place to live before they accept the job. So, uh, again, puts us in great position to recruit workers and businesses out here uh, by really leveraging our quality of life. And that's really, you know, wh where we think we can bring a lot of value, uh, you know, to those conversations. So we're looking forward to that. Um, here's some of the new initiatives going forward. We're going to put together a first ever strategic plan for our organization. We really feel as we've matured and got ourselves into a position to be a really strong player, uh, you know, and partner with the county, that's a good time to really see where we're going to be, you know, one, three, five, ten years. Um, we're going to, uh, you know, continue to uh, push our marketing initiatives up, push and I know Supervisor Gustafson, there's a lot of conversations up in North Shore about, you know, just the impacts and the stresses up there. And so one of our goals is to target a lot of that traveler and really try to start informing them on some other things that are available, you know, places that they could stop on their way up, you know, all that. So just really starting to sell the county as a, as a larger destination. And at the bottom there, you can see we're... Um, you know, obviously we want to be involved. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, doing more, you know, plaster specific site selection. Uh, film offices, uh, you know, recently had their, uh, their study done and uh, so they're really getting ready to go out. So uh, again, we think uh, this is a, a great time for us to be working in close uh, quarters with uh, economic development. A uh, couple budget graphs, you know, I don't love them, but you got to put them in, right? Uh, you can see uh, on the left is our current budget, included some PPP money. Um, and as you see what we're proposing, uh, what really grows there is marketing. You'll see the marketing, um, some facility improvements, um, you know, and our share of, our share of uh, workforce uh, by percentage goes down. So really, this money is really going to really uh, hit the ground and be able to, uh, to help our programs. There's the last slide, but I will. I, uh, so one of my board members, Nancy Nittler, who used to be the HR head here on my board, she, uh, she told me, when you do a presentation, you should always have something that, uh, you know, leave them with something they didn't know. Now, hopefully you guys know this, but I, only, I usually do more. I've, I've got six or seven I rotate. But for you guys, I just did the one because I know we're, I'm already over my time, I'm sure. Uh, Hidden Gems, uh, I was just up here this weekend. That's uh, North Fork off of Immigrant Gap, an incredible swimming hole there. Uh, but this is 
This is a county run swimming pool in Dutch Flat. We all aware of it. It's fantastic. One of the most amazing assets that the county runs for free. Uh, just I've been there many times, barbecue. What's funny is you'll see I, I, uh, the folks up there have their own little board. And uh, even though it's free to the public, most people give some money, but you can see they kindly ask that you do not share your experience here today on social media. <laughs> <laughs> so they want to keep it a hidden gem, uh, and I, I, I know I did. Well, that's kind of my job. I mean, unfortunately, right? But it, it, it doesn't really get as much pressure as you think, and it's just a fantastic asset. So uh, again, love to uh, just one more thing that your board manages, your staff, and um, you know, is a huge one for us. So. That's what I have for you. Um, happy to take questions. Again, really appreciate your time and, and attention today. Um, and happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Rob. Supervisor Holmes. Rob, thank you for your very enthusiastic presentation. <laughs> it yep. kind of grows on you. Uh, I'm just so pleased, you know, you've done a tremendous job. Uh, you've been on this job for four years now? Yeah, so this is uh, yeah. And you took advantage, you, you know, during the downturn, you didn't sit around and complain. You actually enhanced uh, the facility, uh, did more marketing and everything. So I was really appreciate you doing that. And now it's paying off all that uh, all that time. Uh, and so, uh, and then I was here when you, I went to your, when the California Visitors Bureau was the executive director was there. She was yeah. really, really impressed and very dynamic. I really appreciated that. So you're sitting in the old fire station, the yep. used to be the Auburn, and that's city property. Correct. And is there, uh, do they charge you rent on that or is it? You know, the city is, the city of Auburn has been a great partner. Oh, yeah. So they don't, they charge us a dollar a, oh, okay. a, a, good, a good. year, uh, yeah. same as the chamber. Right. Um, they're also looking at a similar arrangement if they can get the uh, Endurance Capital Museum in there. Oh, okay. Um, again, the idea is uh, obviously the value trade-off yeah, that we're, right. we're, so. we're hoping for. So yeah, the City of Auburn's been a fantastic oh, partner for yeah. us. And then uh, I had a question about the museums. You mentioned that. So what is this something new? Is working closer with them? Yeah, so one of the things that Visit California um, wanted to see out of the welcome centers was that they become more experiential you know the idea being that you come up with ways to hook folks in and um, so when we were you know working on the RFP we started trying to think what are the you know where where could we find that synergy right and um, what we have in Placer that's amazing is is a lot of our greatest assets have been around for over a hundred years so we've got this great historical thread through our agriculture through our outdoors um, you know, back to the, you know, the 1960 Olympics, right? The whole thing. So what we did was we talked to, you know, we called the museums and said, hey, we've got this uh, potential project and I uh, would love to partner up with you guys if you're interested. So they came in and, and uh, we did a, you know, we kind of went around, did an assessment. So our, our goal and, and they, we put together a proposal and uh, it wasn't accepted at first uh, for reasons that are bureaucratic, I think, more than it. <laughs> Um, but it did just recently get accepted right. so uh, we're looking at putting some murals in there some all kinds of uh, displays that we hope will allow us to make the connection between what we have now and how it's been a big part of our history and um, so we're super excited about it you know the goal will be to unveil that uh, hopefully by the, around the first of the year um, you know going into the to the next year so okay very exciting very all right, it is exciting. So thank you for your, your leadership and the hard Thanks. work you've done. I appreciate and, uh, it. And you know, your staff back there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the ones that do the actual. Yeah, right. <laughs> Great, thank you, Jim. Any other board comments? Supervisor Jones? Just that I look forward to joining you and seeing the new visitor center. Yeah, it's gonna be great. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll send an email thank today to get thank some you. set up. You bet. Rob, I had a, um, a couple questions. One is on the sustainability. You know, one of the things we hear kind of throughout the foothill communities is when we see all the visitors come in, they don't always have knowledge of how to take care of the area. Right. Are you 
focused on trying to deliver some of that messaging to or, we are yeah. you know uh, during COVID we had we put together the travel responsible video and there's a you know business in California we've all kind of adopted that you know travel code so it's becoming more and more uh, part of all of our messaging I mean that's why I say uh, they don't really call it a marketing you know DMO marketing it's really management okay. because the truth is as you know um, if the residents are having a bad experience, um, it's going to make it a terrible experience for everybody. So it's really, really important that we um, can educate folks on that, on those issues. Great. Thank you for doing that because I know when we've had uh, episodes, especially during COVID, like out at Yankee Gyms or yeah. some of the other popular destinations that do get on social media, right. uh, they can get overrun. No question. And it becomes a challenge for the community members that right. live nearby and that. And so one of the things just yeah. to, uh, that we, you know, so an example of trying to do work to mitigate some of that is like, is the Confluence mm -hmm. shuttle that Auburn mm -hmm. has put in. Right. Uh, we've really tried to work with the city on that to try to get the word out about what, you know, because if you can get people out of the cars, if you've been down to the Confluence on a weekend, it can be pretty insane down there. So um, trying to get people out of cars, you know, that's... It's a great anything. effort. Yeah. And then my other question was, um, how often or have you or do you plan to survey visitors on what they'd like to see improved, what the issues are? I think that would be super helpful to the business communities, the downtown right. areas. Yep. And if Visitor Placer through visit california could look at some survey yeah. data i think that would be extremely helpful to small businesses and sure. small business owners well tiffany and i were just talking about that uh yesterday so she was on a call with one of these um, vendors that does uh -huh. that kind of work because that is really something that it's it's it can be cost prohibitive it's it's not yeah. cheap but i think in this current era it, it's really important to have that data because um because it's the only make that uh, work for everyone. So it's on our radar. Uh, we haven't been in a position really to kind of, I mean, we did a lot of that when we did our um, uh, brand research project, but that was now three years ago, so. Um, well, I think, you know, from at least one board member's perspective, get the numbers, let us know how valuable it is. We'll work with our economic development department and see, you know, what would be best practice to survey once in a while, because I think our small businesses on their own can't do it. Correct. But we as a county, if we can help, yeah. uh, I think that's, uh, you know, a role that yeah. would be good for us to augment. Well, I think it's super forward thinking, yeah. you know, and uh, this is the time to, to really be uh, in the vanguard on this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. because people, I think we, if we learned anything from the pandemic is people are are you know thirsting to get out uh they discovered us that was one of the weird benefits of covid is they really discovered people did placer county and now that they've discovered us they will have an inclination to come back so we want to make sure that we're delivering you know the kinds of experiences mm -hmm. that you know that are positive that's great well great job um and now we'll take public comment on this item anybody in the audience want to speak to us on this anybody on zoom okay then i'd accept a motion to approve this budget amendment mm -hmm. Second. supervisor holmes and supervisor jones and this is a roll call vote gore aye wygan is absent holmes yes jones aye gustafson aye could you clarify that, that the motion also included the approval um, and authorization of the contract? Yes. So clarified? Yes. So clarified? Second? Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Yeah. And thank you, Rob, and the whole team and the board members back there. Thank you. <laughs> thank you guys so, so much. Really looking forward to the next two years. So. Great. Thanks. We have high expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you got to set them high and then... <laughs> okay, we're going to go back to item uh, two for, I'm sorry, item 1A for a moment. Um, we were supposed to take an action on this, not just receive the presentation, but approve their report. So I do need to go back and ask for a motion. Approve. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Holmes and Supervisor Jones. All those in favor? 
Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. So now we'll move on to our 10 a.m. timed item um, from our county executive team. This is Defensible Space Fuels Reduction Pilot Program. Hey. Good morning, Chair Gustafson, members of the board, Ms. Christensen and Ms. Schwab. I'm Melissa O'Neill with your County Executive Office, and with me is your Fire Marshal, Battalion Chief Ryan Wesner. We are here today to request your board approve the establishment of a pilot program that would provide funding for defensible space fuels reduction work for very low income senior and disabled property owners in unincorporated Placer County at a total cost of $200,000 over two years. We are also requesting your board approve a budget amendment to transfer $100,000 in general fund revenue to community and agency support to fund the first year of this program in fiscal year 22-23. For a little background on this program, the County Executive Office along with OES and Code Enforcement staff have been working together to develop this pilot program and to pursue grant funding, which has so far been unsuccessful. However, as Chief Wessner will discuss in a moment, there is a need for this program to help protect our most vulnerable residents in our communities, and so staff is requesting your board approve this pilot program while we continue our efforts to secure additional funding. Chief. Thank you, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. My name is Ryan Wessner, Placer County Fire Marshal. And being the person that goes out and supervises the inspections for and and holding up the hazardous vegetation ordinance that Placer County passed, one of the main things that we've been seeing is the gap between the thriving elderly communities that we have in the foothills and the ability to conform to the hazardous vegetation ordinance. And that being said, it's not the big picture stuff, the you know, acres of um, wildland vegetation, it's always the small stuff. As being a community um, risk reduction and um, being a community member, the last thing that I want to do is put somebody at danger for doing a small job. And one of those things, for example, is pine needles in the high country, oak leaves in the low country. I can't in good conscience say that I'm going to write you up for one thing that has uh, your oak, you need to get the leaves off your roof and then expect them to ladder that roof and do the job per the hazardous ordinance and walk away. I just needed to um, come up with another plan. Maybe having a workforce, somebody that we can call professional roofers, people that climb ladders all the time for a living, that we can have a list of something to reach out to, call them and say, hey, I have a small job for you. Let's get some, some leaves off some roofs. And then furthermore, going back into um, some of the uh, examples that I have is, to get this pilot program started, we're, again, we're not looking at the 5, 10, 15 acres. We're looking at what's going to best make that house and the people in the house survivable in an event. The 100 feet zone around the house and the, um, and, and the access and egress. So 15 feet on each side of the driveway, 100 feet around the house. Um, if we can get that accomplished, not only is that house survivable, but the neighbor's house is more than likely to be survivable also. Most of the time that when we run into this problem, the people are there, they've lived there for a long time, they're more than willing to do the work, it's just tough for them to do some of the work, especially this time of year. So having, a, um, having this, this program started would greatly help bridge the gap between the thriving elderly community and the hazardous vegetation ordinance that we passed. With that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so some important points about how the program is planned to work. Um, in order to target the highest risk and most at need residents, potentially eligible property owners would be identified through contact with code enforcement via complaints. A defensible space inspector or DSI would prepare the hazardous vegetation inspection form and discuss with the property owner what abatement is needed. Um, the DSI would provide potentially eligible property owners with information on this program and an application. 
Once eligibility has been established, the property owner would be provided with a list of qualified contractors developed by procurement services. The contractor would work with, DS, with the DSI to perform the work as prescribed, and once the DSI has verified that the work is complete, they will sign off on the contractor's invoice, which will then be paid by the county. Eligibility for this program would be restricted to property owners in unincorporated Placer County who are at least 65 of age or are permanently disabled and meet the very low income requirements as defined by the California Department of Housing and Community Development. So up to $5,000 would be available per property and the property owner would be responsible for the abatement of remaining fuels if applicable. It's important to note that this would not be a grant program and no money will be exchanged between the county and the property owners. Um, a minimum of 20 properties each year could be treated through this program. However, um, we expect that most abatements would not require the full amount as, as Ryan noted, these are targeting smaller jobs. And uh, that would result in many more properties that could be served. Um, that concludes our presentation. And we welcome any questions you may have and we thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much, Melissa and Chief. Supervisor Gore. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the presentation and the creative way you're looking at how to make sure that we keep um, residents and other properties safe. My question, and I'm certainly for it, for it, my question is, is there an opportunity to utilize volunteers in some way, like partnering with some of the fire safe councils or things like that in the future, right? Because there's probably a larger need than dollars out, out there, and just want to see if that might be an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we have a, actually we have a checklist. So the first time when we make contact with somebody and they can't do it or we deem that they're going to have problems doing it, um, we go to the family members and see if they have anybody that's close by and um, do some social engineering that way. And then the next step is always the fire safe councils. Okay. See what they have in place. Um, go to the MAC. If I, I usually can figure out who, who who's running that area or whatever area it is, and then. Um, see what they have in place. And then from there, we just we keep working on it till we can get somebody to um, come out and help them out. Thank you. And then I, I wanted to note there, there is discussion with the Placer RCD to tie into this program as well, to be a contractor for the larger jobs when the chipper program is slow, so that they, can, they, can, they would be able to provide the service at a much lower cost than a private contractor could. And so there is that potential as well to tie them in. Great idea. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. I'm um, yeah, Supervisor Jones. <laughs> Good <laughs> morning. Robert. Thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering if you have other ways to reach out to people who may qualify for this, um, other than code enforcement officers. So, so due to the the small amount of funding we're requesting of your board right now, we we are concerned that the the need would greatly um, overweigh the amount of funding available. And so for the pilot program, we initially were going to target those folks that are considered highest risk due to their interaction with code enforcement with the goal of um, reducing the number of folks who have liens placed on their property because of their inability to perform this work. And so um, there is definitely the potential to, to develop a more robust program that could be available to the broader public um, if we're able to obtain um, additional funding from additional sources other than the county general fund. Oh, okay, so the whole program is going to is hinges on whether you can get more money, grant money for the program. So that's what we're anticipating to be an issue. Okay, yes. good. Well, does any way we can help? Thank you. Absolutely, Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Chair. So I'm uh, unclear about how these uh, properties are identified. Uh, there has to be a complaint with code enforcement, and can the property owner complain about their? <laughs> I, I'm unclear how that how that would work. Would neighbor would complain about their neighbor's property or? I got cor correct. We, however, it gets brought to our attention, whether it's through a complaint or um, where they call us up and say, "Hey, can you come take a look at this? What do we need to do?" We'll still go out and, um, like I said, we our de defensible space. It's not so much code enforcement; it is as education and coaching. Right. So we'll tell them what would they need to do and and how best to do it and then at, this is where this program might step in and like i said bridge that gap between small jobs and help out the elderly so if someone contacted my office and said mr holmes i have a property my neighbor can you that would that would suffice absolutely okay all right sounds good and then uh, once they're identified you do the inspection and now you have to 
uh, qualify the homeowner if they qualify. That's correct. Do you have a, is there a navigator that can help these folks? You know, they typically don't really like to fill out all this paperwork. And sure, all, so, yeah. so the target, the goal is to have the application be as simple as possible. Yeah. So we're asking, we're going, we're planning to, so the program is still in development pending yeah. your board's approval. Okay. But the initial plan is to require, uh, request a, um, a copy of the tax return to el verify income eligibility. And then um, just a simple um, disabil disabled placard from the DMV or something to establish disability um, age would of course be verified through it identification. Um, our defensible space inspectors are, are amazing. I can't speak highly enough about um, how creative they are in assisting these folks and getting their properties remediated. And um, Steve Renz especially, I've been working with him directly on developing this program. And he said that he would sit with them and help them fill out the oh, application okay. themselves. He would deliver the paperwork to me. He would go above and beyond to get these folks the help that they need. And so uh, the prob probation department has a program where they have uh, some of their uh, probationers are helping out and these would they be qualified to help with this kind of program that's that's information we would have to look into okay. for sure right. I I, th I believe in in the past there's been some concern about those folks doing work on private property just liability wise oh. um, but 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 simply certainly something we can look into okay this, this is exciting really glad to see this come forward it's a much needed uh, service for uh, a lot of the folks in the rural areas that you know they lost a spouse the kids are moved away um, they, you know, they were proud of their yard and used to take care of it, but now they're not unable to, and so it, they worry about it. So I think this is really a, a great program. So I appreciate you bringing it forward. Thank you. Great, and and I would just echo um, everything that my counterparts have said, and love to see the tracking on how quickly we go through this money because this budget amendment could be amended again. If there's that much demand, I think uh, many of our residents are looking forward to having this opportunity. Appreciate all the hard work that's gone into developing this pilot program. Um, are there any public comments on this item? Oh, Supervisor Holmes. I just want to know how soon would this program be? Once we approve it, it's you're ready to go. Is that well? So uh, procurement has to develop a qualified list, and they can't oh. run with that before board approval. So there's some steps that have to occur behind the scenes before we can highlight the you know daylight the program. But we're hoping to um, have it in place by um, the, by the fall this year. Okay, before fire season. That's a joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was. Really Let me get my time machine. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? I'm not seeing any here and none online. With that, I'd entertain a motion. Holmes and Gore, and this is a roll call vote as well. Gore? Aye. Wygan is absent. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Okay. Thank We're you. Just a, thank you very much. We're just a few minutes before our 1030 timed item, so we'll go back to a department item. Yes, so we'll move to item 8D, and this is the funds management agreement number two with Housing Trust Placer. And I think I see our Housing Trust Placer representatives as well as Michelle Kingsbury here to present this item. Thank you, Megan. Morning, Chair, members of the board, Michelle Kingsbury with the Community Development Resource Agency. Thank you very much for moving us up on the agenda. <laughs> um, the item before you today um, request approval to enter into a five year funds management agreement with the Housing Trust Placer for use of the affordable housing and employee accommodation fees. Housing Trust Placer, as you're well aware, is a nonprofit corporation formed in 2020 to help meet the affordable housing needs of the Placer County communities. In May of 2021, the county entered into its first funds management agreement with Housing Trust Placer, which provided um, HTP with $575,000. Uh, that $575,000 was broken up into two components. 
the first being a $75,000 allocation that went towards startup and um, administrative costs, as well as a half a million dollars for program and project costs. HTP was successful in leveraging that half million dollar initial investment to gain an additional $500,000 allocation from the state of California uh, through its Housing and Community Development Department Local Housing Trust Fund program uh, that would assist in a variety of affordable housing endeavors. HTP is currently awaiting their funds management agreement through the state uh, to begin to set up and implement programs under that um, grant. I would also like to note HTP is also working on moving other projects forward in unincorporated uh, county as well as, as well as partnering and working in projects in Rockland and Lincoln and outreaching as well to our Tahoe housing organizations. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Dan Heldridge, the director of HTP, as well as Dave Cook, board member, are here today um, to answer any specific questions that you may have. Small, uh, sorry for the PowerPoint being so small, but I'll go through real quickly what the funds management agreement is. Um, the first funds management agreement that was entered into really set forth the stage um, to consider future um, either amendments to that agreement or separate agreements um, looking for, toward other types of um, investment from the county with HTP to move further um, affordable housing or employee accommodation projects. So this funds management agreement number two specifically targets are affordable housing in lieu fees and employee accommodation fees that are collected pursuant to an ordinance adopted by your board back in 2020. Uh, these fees are paid by certain eligible projects that are eligible to pay these fees versus constructing affordable or employee accommodation units on site. Uh, to date, we've collected around $169,000, uh, which is from the affordable housing fees in West Placer County. Um, as of the writing of this memo, there were no um, employee accommodation fees collected from our East Placer County side. What this agreement does is provide a mechanism for the county to transfer collected fees to HTP and for HTP to manage the use of these fees to meet the requirements of not only the ordinance, which set up the fees, as, but also through our housing trust fund guidelines. Uh, the county would transfer on a semi-annual basis any collected fees. However, if there's no fees collected, there is no guarantee of any in, um, future income being transferred over to HTP. However, this is a five-year agreement, which really locks the county into the program with HTP and kind of sets up this uh, framework for transfer of funds. If projects do come into the county seeking use of these fees, we would simply just forward them over to HTP, who would be administering uh, the programs um, pursuant to the guidelines. We've also written into the agreement what we call a five-day um, eligibility determination period, and that just simply means if HTP does have a program or project which they want to use the funds, they would just either send an email or correspondence to staff. We would just double check pursuant to our guidelines and ordinance that the use of those funds is eligible, um, and then HTP can move forward. And in addition, there's annual reporting required, um, which is pretty typical of these types of agreements. To conclude, uh, staff is requesting your board to approve a five-year funds management agreement uh, to provide the affordable housing and lieu fees and employee accommodation fees to Housing Trust Placer for purposes consistent with the Housing Trust Fund program guidelines. Authorize our Community Development Resource Agency Director or designee uh, to enter into the agreement and take all other ne actions necessary to implement the agreement, which includes the initial release of funds and any future releases on a semi-annual basis. Last but not least, we did include two options uh, to extend the term, um, and there are two three-year additional options that are in the agreement. Um, as I mentioned, I know this is quick, but we do have Dan as well as Dave Cook here available if you have any specific questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Michelle. And I heard that you had said that for the East Plaster area, there haven't been any funds collected to date. I think that that was my only question, and Cindy, maybe you may be aware, but one of my concerns is because housing is so very, very difficult to even build in East Placer, um, does it make sense to get any funds that are collected from East Placer to bring into Housing Trust Placer when we've already, you know, we're working hard to get some projects off the ground currently? Uh, I just, my preference would be to not take any funds from East Placer and, and put it into the Housing Trust where it's hard enough to get them done in East Placer, maybe keep the dollars on the East Placer side. 
So to answer the question, you are correct. Um, we haven't collected any employee, employee accommodation fees to date for the East Placer side. Um, the ordinance does segregate out, you know, East Placer versus West Placer, um, and any transmittals we would make sure we designate where the funds can be used. You are right. I mean, it takes some time to build up a fund, and that really is what this agreement is. It sets that that time frame of five years to try and build up a fund for HTP um, to collect those um, funds and use them for the appropriate purposes. Um, but there's no guarantee that we will collect any fees for east side that could be used um, in the east side of the county. So we, we are segregating though. We're keeping right. track of those by fund. And similar to our earlier discussion, we could pay interest to, if we borrow against, because we don't have a project from one area to the other, we could talk about interest at the 0.42% <coughs> rate yeah. back. Would there be if an needed? Would there be an opportunity uh, if there was a project taking place in East Plaster to maybe um, have the Housing Trust Placer provide some, if those dollars were accumulated, right, for some, provide some funding to a project that's not their project in East Plaster? Might that be an opportunity? I believe so. Um, so as an example, if there, is, if there was a project in the east side of the county that needed a million dollars, but we had only collected a million dollars for the, the affordable accommodation fees on the west side, it would really be up to the board and Housing Trust Placer um, to come forward and, and transfer those funds, or excuse me, loan the funds mm -hmm. uh, for the east um, county side that would be ultimately repaid. It just would be something we'd have to consider in the future. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Jones. Good morning, Good morning. Michelle. How are you? Well, thank you. Um, I have a question. Oh, well, I have a couple questions. Um, so is, you're asking us to approve a five-year funds management agreement to provide county affordable housing in lieu fees and employee accommodation fees to Housing Trust Placer for purposes consistent with the Placer County Housing Trust Program guidelines. It, are the Housing Trust guidelines in our packet here? So the housing trust fund guidelines should be attached to the agreement as an exhibit to that agreement. Okay, okay, good, good. And then um, further down, it says that um, collectively, HDB can use these funds for a variety of affordable housing endeavors. What does that mean? <laughs> so anything from setting up a home buyer program, um, things that are consistent with what the guidelines say are eligible uses or projects. It could be programs, it could be uh, funding a project, either doing pre-development or gap type financing. Those are um, eligible types of uses. Okay, so I'm kind of curious. It says their recent initiatives included securing an option to purchase a 21 acre parcel in the I-80 corridor. Uh, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I thought it was more about, like you said, gap funding or, you know, for the purposes of actually building the affordable housing. I'm not sure we're purchasing property but maybe you can just clarify. So they haven't seek, sought to use these funds to purchase that property. If they're looking to use these funds to purchase that property, they'd have to kind of follow the procedure, write a, write a memo or note to us, and then we'd make a determination if that was an eligible use. If not, it would be a subject to a separate action to be considered by your board. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Um, then I'm curious about Sorry about that. I had a lot of questions here. Um, so the term of the agreement, is there a, a particular reason why you're seeking a five-year agreement, not a two-year or three-year? Five years provides um, a reasonable period of time to build a fund. I mean, two years is a pretty short yeah. uh, time frame. We could hit a recession or economic cycle where there's no revenues coming in. And it also provides some predictability that we have this agreement in place right. in that duration okay. for them. Yeah, because so far to date, how much money is in the account? There was about 169,000 collected for that are these fees. Oh, okay. Okay, I know one of my arguments has always been I think our ME fees are lacking. <laughs> I think they should be better. And then there's a section in here, C, about prevailing wage. So I'm just curious. I thought that the Housing Trust Placer would kind of um, preclude us from having to pay prevailing wage because we're a government entity. We would have to pay prevailing wage. But it looks like here 
that um, they may be required to pay prevailing wage as well. It's a pretty standard statement that we include, include in a lot of our agreements. These are funds that are collected by the county and then transferred over to HTP. On a case-by-case -case basis, the determination would need to be made whether or not prevailing wage is that any use of funds is subject to that. Okay, so it's still possible they may it's not have to pay. It's a disclosure statement more than anything. Oh, okay. And then on L, the county role, um, can you clarify that? It <laughs> says, acknowledges that county is entering into this agreement in a proprietary fund role only, independent of and unrelated to any review of any decision on any approvals which county and or other public entities may have undertaken or may subsequently undertake. Sorry about that. I just need to look at Karen. I'll <laughs> put my legal hat on. Um, it's a disclosure statement again that we're transferring these funds over to HTP for HTP to manage on our um, those funds. They would have their own review process um, and not subject to our own low committees or things of that nature. Okay, so we're going to transfer this over to them and then trust them to manage it, and we're not going to butt in. Well, we do <laughs> kind have of in a, kind of in a lay statement there. No, it's a great question too. So we do have again the five-year determine or five-day determination of eligibility, and then we also do have the annual reporting built in where we'll monitor um, the use of funds. And and lastly, we do have a really good relationship with HTP. We call, we talk, um, and we work together in a partnership to try and move projects forward. Um, this also provides some streamlining um, because we do have delays. If the county were to continue to manage the funds. You know, we've got a process, we have delays, and, and it provides a bit more of a streamlined basis for HTP to manage those funds. Okay, great. Thank you for answering all my questions. Kept me on my toes. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I don't see any other questions from the board members. I would like to invite Dave and, and or Dan to come up and address the board. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Dave Cook, board chair for Housing Trust Placer. Uh, we appreciate uh, your consideration of this item. Uh, we've enjoyed a good, strong working relationship with county staff. We've got a number of things underway that we're pretty excited about, and we're hopeful that this funding is going to help support those efforts in terms of controlling sites, entitling them, and either selling to or partnering with an affordable builder. To be clear, we're not going to build anything we're simply trying to help facilitate this so uh, again appreciate your support on this item great thank you Dave I, I might ask you a question I, I didn't want to put Michelle on the spot do you mind sharing with us a little bit about your board members and your board makeup because I think that helps the public understand sure. who we're entrusting these funds to to make okay. sure we get projects done so our board is comprised of a variety of professionals um, in the real estate business, uh, primarily architects, um, attorneys, um, we've got bankers, uh, we have uh, those not dissimilar from my background who have done entitlement and development projects in and around the county, some with specific experience um, with multifamily. Uh, we have somebody who works in the affordable housing sector. So it, it's a wide range of, of professionals who understand the housing business, the entitlement business, and, and some like the bankers who have had some tax credit um, experience as well. So very well-rounded and complemented um, significantly by our CEO's background, uh, Dan Helderidge uh, with Morgan Stanley and the community uh, development uh, community finance sector and has brought uh, really a, a great uh, deal of strength uh, to what is already a, a good strong board so hopefully that addresses your question absolutely and I think it's just great for the public to hear what a board you've put together to make sure that you have the expertise necessary um, because we all know we need housing and affordable workforce housing for our community members so and it's, it's, it's been a particular challenge in this uh, economic climate here over the last couple of years to, to compete and attempt to control sites where we might be able to do affordable projects. But Thank uh, you. we're going to continue the efforts. Thank Super. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, are there any other members of the public that would like to address this item? I'm not seeing any here in the room.
Nobody on Zoom. Okay, the three actions we need to take are listed on the screen. Do I have a motion for those actions? I will move approval of the three action items. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Dave and Dan. Okay, we're going to go back to our 1030 timed item. And this is South Placer Wastewater Authority Sewer Connection Fee Annual Adjustment. Hi, and good morning. Chair Gustafson, members of the board. Uh, I'm Robin Mahoney, Senior Civil Engineer with Department of Public Works. Uh, today, staff is requesting three actions from your board. Number one, conduct a public hearing to receive public testimony regarding a proposal to increase the sewer connection fees for sewer maintenance districts two and three and county service area 28, zones of benefit 2A3 and 173 from $10,137 to $11,132 per equivalent dwelling unit to reflect increases in the regional component approved by the South Placer Wastewater Authority. Two, adopt an ordinance amending section 1312350 of the Placer County Code to increase sewer connection fees. And three, make a finding pursuant to section 21080B8 of the Public Resource Code that the higher fees are derived directly from the cost of providing service and therefore exempt from environmental review. As for background, wastewater collected within sewer maintenance districts two, Granite Bay, and three, Horseshoe Bar, County Service Area 28, Zones of Benefit 2A3, Sunset, and 173 Dry Creek, is conveyed to one of two wastewater treatment plants owned and operated by the City of Roseville, the Dry Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant and the Pleasant Grove Wastewater Treatment Plant. The funding mechanism for the wastewater treatment plants is through the South Placer Wastewater Authority, or SPWA, a joint powers authority comprised of the City of Roseville, Placer County, and the South Placer Municipal Utility District. Connection fees from all sewer entities utilizing these wastewater treatment plants include a regional component that is used by SPWA to fund wastewater treatment plant expansions. The current connection fee in these four county districts and CSAs is $10,137 per equivalent dwelling unit or EDU, which includes an $8,669 per EDU regional component and a $1,468 per EDU local component that is retained within each county district and CSA. On July 1st, 2022, SPWA increased the regional connection fee to $9,664 per EDU based upon the one year period increase in the engineering news record construction cost index as specified by the Roseville Municipal Code and consistent with the SPWA agreements. The proposed increase uh, in front of you today is strictly a pass through of the increase in the regional component of the connection fee. The local portion of the connection fee will remain unchanged. Staff recommends your board increase the connection fee by the $995 increase in the regional component, thereby bringing the connection fee to $11,132 in these specified districts. With that, I will answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate it. Are there questions, board members, on this item? I'm not seeing any. Uh, this is a public hearing, so we're going to open the public hearing now to receive any public testimony on this item. Is there anyone in the room who would like to speak on this item? I'm not seeing any here. Boy, a quiet group today. <laughs> okay, we'll close the public hearing, and then we um, are being asked to adopt an ordinance amending Section 13.12350 of the Placer County Code to increase the sewer connection fees and make a finding to Section 21080B8 of the Public Resource Code that the higher fees are derived directly from the cost of providing service and therefore exempt from environmental review. Do I have such a motion? I will move approval even though I hate all this inflationary, all these high inflationary adjustments. A motion with 
objection. How's that? No, we, have to, we have to do it, but it's, it's terrible to see that the cost of doing business has gone up dramatically. Dramatically. Um, yep. Because of inflation. Yep. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? Thank you, Supervisor Holmes. Uh, and then all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Try to bring that inflation down. That's, yeah. We'd all like that. Okay, we're going to move on now to our 1035 timed item. This is our CEDRA department, and this is an appeal of Planning Commission's denial of the Sorensen variance. PLN 21-00460, it's on 20, page 27 of our board packet. Hi, Adam, thank you. Good morning. Adam Anderson, I am uh, representing Placer County Planning Division in this item, and today we will be going over the Sorensen variance and their appeal of the Planning Commissioners, the Commission's denial of that variance. So today we'll be considering, uh, considering an appeal of a Planning Commission's denial of a variance to allow an existing shop to be set 3.74 feet from the north property line and a zero foot setback for a nine foot high retaining wall on the north property line where 30 feet is normally required. The project site is located in the Colfax area at 25440 Pine View Drive. Uh, the site is just to the, um, just at the border of the, uh, no pointing today, oh, there we go. There it is. Uh, it's just to the border of the river fire. This is the fire scar that came up along this way. And you can see the city of Colfax down here, the high school, and this is um, 193. The zoning for the site, it is zoned farm with a combining minimum building site uh, area of 43, or 43, which is one acre. The parcels to the south and east are both under the same designation. And then the parcels to the north, they have a minimum lot area of 2.3 acres. The, the lot that we're actually looking at is 3.3 acres. And there's also the special study corridor located to the west. Uh, that is a special designation within the community plan uh, that just requires additional review for design elements that can be viewed from the river. The site plan provided here, it does indicate that we do have a rather significant slope that uh, goes from, this is where they enter the property from, and then it slopes downwards to uh, eventually the, the river is down here, but uh, the property slopes rather significantly downward at about 16 to 22% slope. And the existing shop, as you can see there, is the three foot from the property line. And the current retaining wall is actually extending four feet into the neighbor's property. And uh, this variance only uh, was requesting a zero foot setback there. They are recognizing that they cannot put um, structures on the neighbor's property. So the background of the site is a little bit um, extensive. And we'll start with uh, the beginning of the project, which was a retaining wall that was constructed back in 2011. And that was uh, constructed without the benefit of a permit. Then we had the shop itself that began to be constructed in 2014, also without the benefit of a permit. The county received a complaint in July of 2018 that complaint was specifically about building without permits. At this time, the property line was not mentioned in the complaint. Um, it was specifically just about acquiring a building permit for the retaining wall and the structure. So uh, Mr. Sorensen, the property owner, came in and complied with uh, the requirement to get a after-the-fact building permit for the site. That was in April of 2019. 
Uh, he represented at that time that the structure and the retaining wall were 20 feet from property line, or were 30 feet from property line as required. And the building permits were issued at that time uh, for, the, for the retaining wall and the structure. So then we received a second complaint after the issuance of those after the fact permits. That second complaint uh, specified that they believed that the property line was a concern and that setbacks weren't being met. At that time, uh, we requested clarification on the, uh, the, where the property line was that came through our code enforcement office. Uh, we received a survey in September of 2020 that detailed where that property line was and that's where we get the 3.74 foot uh, termination that uh, came from a, a survey. So after receiving that information, the after the fact permit, building permit for the wall and shop were denied. Uh, their setback inspection, it was failed. And they, the property owner was notified that they would have to get a variance to get that structure approved at that distance. Variance was applied for and the hearing was held in January of 2022. And uh, that, that uh, that variance hearing with the zoning administrator, uh, it was denied at that time, and then a appeal of that decision went to the Planning Commission in April of 2022. These are images from the site. Uh, this is the structure here, and this would be where the property line is, and this is the retaining wall here that uh, the property line goes through and this portion would need to be removed as a portion of approval of the variance. This is indicating how severe of a slope we do have here. This is the retaining wall looking to the north. This is the retaining wall looking towards the east. Uh, from this post here, straight up is the property line. So from everything to the left of this port would need to be removed in order to uh, not be on the neighbor's property. This is another image just showing the, the slope in the area and that it's not just his property that is sloped, it is um, other properties in the community are similarly sloped and developed on. Well, would be developed on if the fire didn't burn a lot of them down. So. A portion of us approving a variance does require us to make certain findings. Uh, these are the findings that are required uh, specifically that there are special circumstances applicable to the property that is usually based on size, shape, and topography. Furthermore, the variance would need to be, uh, does not grant a, would not constitute a grant of special privileges, nor would it need to uh, not be allowed in the zoning district and that the granting of the uh, variance does not authorize a use that's not otherwise allowed in the zoning district and that the variance is consistent with the Placer County General Plan and the, that the variance is the minimum departure from the requirements of the ordinance and is necessary to grant relief to the applicant. During the zoning administrator hearing that occurred in January of 2020, we did uh, receive two public commenters. Specifically, one was the neighbor to the north and the other was the neighbor to the south. The neighbor to the south, uh, their comments were related to a different uh, item and were not, uh, were not relevant to what was currently being discussed with the northern property line. The neighbor to the north um, his concern was that the, the, if we allowed that structure to remain on site, it would hinder where he could develop on his site, and he had specific concerns uh, about the safety of the structure and th of the retaining wall. After hearing the staff's presentation, zoning administrator decided to take an action uh, to deny the applicant's request for a variance, and he found that the property was uniform in shape and meets the one acre zoning minimum and that the shop could have been located in uh, a location that would comply with the setback requirements and that uh, relief was not required in this situation. Oops, where are we? There. 
we received a letter of appeal to the zoning administrator's uh, determination. That letter of appeal contended three specific points. First, that the topography of the site uh, limits the buildable area and requires a retaining wall to be built. Second, that the location of the shop was necessary to allow for fire access. And third, that the construction of the shop and wall was placed due to a misunderstanding of where the property line was located. So the site is sloped, and, but the slope does not restrict development on the site. Uh, the retaining walls could have been constructed in a manner that would have met the required setbacks, and then the, pro or the structure itself could have been constructed in a way to meet the required setbacks as well. Uh, the zoning administrator determined that the grounds uh, for granting the shop and wall, uh, no special circumstances could be made in that regard. Furthermore, for the second uh, appeal point, fire determined that there was already adequate fire access to the site. That would be indicated by the red hammerhead there. Uh, Mr. Soren and the blue portion is the potential buildable area that we had identified at that time. And then the yellow area is the, uh, the current shop location. Lastly, uh, the point of whether that the shop was located due to a misunderstanding. The, it is the property owner's responsibility to be aware of where their property lines are and what they are uh, depicting on their site plan when they submit for a building permit. And in this situation, this was what was uh, received during the after the fact building permit portion. And it indicated that the property line here was 30 feet. Uh, so that is what the staff had to go off of when we review and approve these after the fact permits. And uh, it's only once we are, once we receive additional information that we require a survey or something to clarify where those property lines are. At the Planning Commission hearing, there was uh, an appeal of the decision by the Zoning Administrator, and that was heard in April of 2022. There was one public commenter as well, that was the neighbor to the north, who uh, further expressed that uh, his same concerns from the initial hearing, that he believed that the structure itself was uh, potentially dangerous along with the retaining wall, and that it limited where he was allowed to build on his property. The Planning Commission took into consideration the circumstances of when the structures were built and uh, listen to uh, information from the property owner and from the neighbor specifically about uh, where the go back a little bit in the original site plan it was brought up that that the septic area here it does limit where this shop could be built uh, the septic area needs to be included here, and it was updated in a future site plan that the shop could not be located 30 feet off the property line because then it would be in the septic area. Uh, that was heard at the Planning Commission, and they understood that, but they uh, were not able to make the finding that it was the minimum departure at three feet. Uh, they believed that this buildable area the structure could be pushed 10 to 15 feet down and still not impact the septic area. Oops, apology. So the, uh, they found no special circumstances applicable in the request and upheld the zoning administrator's denial of the variance request. At this point, we received two additional comments of uh, uh, items of appeal as we come before your hearing body. Those two additional uh, points were that it was not possible to locate the structure elsewhere on the property as it is limited by the septic system, which we have uh, already discussed. And the neighboring lot to the north, it has a power line that crosses it and that that area would not be eligible to be developed by the neighbor to the north anyways because they have that existing power line easement there. Um, the circumstances 
of the property to the north is not a reason why we can grant special circumstances to the property to the south. We are limited into what we can see and what we can approve based off of the property itself, not the surrounding properties. So staff is going to uh, make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors today that you take the following actions. Deny the appeal filed by Sven Storensen. Uh, uphold the Planning uh, Commission's denial, decision to deny the appeal of the Zoning Administrator's denial of the variance. And find the project is statutorily exempt from environmental review pursuant to Section 15270 of the California Environmental Quality Act and Section 18.36.010 of the California Envir or of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance for projects which are disapproved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. I appreciate the thorough presentation. Uh, board members, do we have any questions now, or do we want to hear from the appellant? Okay. Is that okay? We'll. No other questions? Great, thank you. Then we're going to open the public hearing and hear first uh, from the appellant, uh, Sorensen's. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Thanks Cindy. for hearing our appeal for not having a a 30-foot setback. Um, I'd like to read to you our statement. We have learned many things during this process. At first we thought we knew what we were doing and then discovered we didn't know how to find out what we didn't know. One of those things is that we were able to invite the board to visit the site. We were not aware it was an option to invite the past board who denied our variance and thank you for visiting. We are extremely remorseful that the project was started without first apply applying for a permit since we were under the assumption that an outbuilding with no plumbing or electrical needed one, even after working with an architect and having an inspection and making changes to bring things up to code, we were still not aware of the need for a 30-foot setback until the building was completed. We have been hoping we would be able to purchase enough land from our neighbor to make it right <coughs> before coming here today. It was recommended by the last board that we um, attempt to purchase land to make it uh, where we have a setback, setback of 30 feet. Our neighbor, Mr. Matthew, told us after our first appeal, he would work with us if we lifted the restraining <coughs> order we were granted to stop his year's worth of harassment for our one-time refusal to loan him our equipment at the onset of quarantine. We went back to court to have a judge remove the restraining order, but Mr. Matthew became non-responsive to our attempts to contact him and at first, he was non-responsive to the surveyor, Stephen Kilmer. Stephen submitted a statement for the board of his inability to meet with Mr. Matthew during the 60 days since our last hearing. Mr. Matthew is asking a prohibitive amount of 30,000 for 30 feet of unbuildable land next to our garage. Even if Mr. Matthew would meet with our surveyor, we, need, we see no way to make it happen as we are leery that Mr. Matthew is giving us false hope. The reason we are skeptical that Mr. Matthew will ever actually sell us the land necessary to fix our issue is due to our witnessing his lack of cooperation. When a judge was ready to give us the restraining order, Mr. Matthew tearfully told the judge he still wanted to be friends. The judge then asked if we would go to an arbitrator. We agreed and left the courtroom with the temporary restraining order still in place. We hired an arbitrator who was able to reach, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Matthew, four or more times, each time Mr. Matthew would only tell her he wanted his guns back. I apologize for the negativity. We are not here to hurt our neighbors, but we believe he's here to hurt us. And um, to Cindy's uh, suggestion, we have um, reached out to John mm -hmm. in a text and uh, tried to <coughs> excuse me, um, offer our portion of land for his portion of land. And I never received anything back from John. He had contacted our surveyor and told him uh, that he would be at this meeting. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you leave the podium, board members, do you have any questions of the Sorensons? Uh, I might have one, which is uh, you build the retaining wall in 2011, and the retaining wall, we've come to find out, is on Mr. Matthew's property. Was Mr. Matthew aware uh, that that was on his property? Yes, he was. Uh, when we built this, John Matthew was uh, helping with the construction of the retaining wall. He was employed by the contractor that was yeah. working for us. Yeah. And there was no issue at that time about where the property line was or anything and till the virus and that I had told him that he couldn't use our equipment and then John got a rate and we're, here we are today uh, trying to fix this problem. Okay. I appreciate uh, that background because I know there's a number of issues here that the board needs to consider and I think it's important to understand many of us don't know where our property lines are now you understand and unfortunately it's after the fact that we need to know where our property corners are right <laughs> and I'm sure if uh, you had known that before you would have <laughs> yeah it would have been a lot different uh, Save we did money. hire an um, architect and he's the one that set up the plans for the building and I told him how to how I wanted to build it and stuff and, and he drew it up and that's when we submitted it to Placer County mm -hmm. he he was the one that was told us that we were in good shape with the property lines you know uh, yeah. okay thank you uh, are there any other oh yes, yes Supervisor I have, Jones I have one question <coughs> Can you go back to the slide of the original site site plan? Do you have the one with the red? This was what was submitted during the, um, with the red? during the variance yeah. submittal, but the one that we wanted to add. Could have been on page 17, which doesn't seem to have been made it to the. Uh... No, it was. It was. We have this one that's got the red. It was right before your background. There, there it is. I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you. There it is. Good. Good. Thank you. Okay. So my question to you folks is that this is the original site plan that you submitted, and on it it shows, um, well. I'm guessing about a 30 foot setback from your building to the property line. So did someone just draw that property line or how, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. you're showing it as being 30 foot setback, but yet. Yeah, that was the architect that we hired. Okay, so the architect drew this. Yes. Right. Yeah. So not much of a, okay. Um, thank you. I, I don't have more questions for them oh, right so now. So maybe just to clarify, Gore? right, so the concern was, the assumption was that the property line was 30 feet. Would, mm -hmm. do, you, how, do you know how he came to that conclusion? No, uh, uh, he, he went out to the pole to the farthest end of our property, and he, he said that he thought, well, all the property around was down the power lines, that was it. So he assumed that it was where the, pro the power, yeah, power line lines. Yeah, power lines, 25 foot easement from the power lines on both sides, and then that would be our property line. Okay, thank you. My other question then <coughs> would be, have you, did you ever hire a survey to, to determine the, your property boundaries? We have now, after the fact, yes. Uh, that's um, that's that Steve first. Kilmore. Yeah. Okay. But that's after the fact. We, Right, because yeah. I was understanding that maybe your neighbor hired the surveyor. Oh, was it uh, the neighbor or was there it? There is a document now that, that he has been produced since all this has been built. Uh -huh. It's telling us where the property line is. Okay, because my question is, have, have you folks ever hired a surveyor to determine the correct property lines? Yeah. Or did you depend on that one? Well, oh, we no. depended on that one. Because, we have our own. Yeah. You do. But we does it ref on that one. Does it reflect the same exact boundary yeah. lines as the other That's surveyor? Right. Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> All right, good, thank you. If I confused you, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm just trying to determine. So if, the, if your neighbor had a surveyor survey the property boundaries, does, is that the same as the, sur as the, the result of the surveyor you hired, the, the property boundaries reflected the same? Yes, and it was all done after the building was constructed. Yeah, but it, he, he, he didn't survey it because we were waiting for a decision from what's going on here, because we thought that we would be able to get a, what do you call, a lot adjustment. Mm -hmm. And then that's all fell through too. So we did have him, and they did check down that line, and they said that the f survey that was issued is, it's close enough. For me to buy it, yeah, it's it's right. There's no it, there's no sense in arguing over two feet or a, whatever. Well, if the two feet area. is in your favor, I would argue it. Yeah, but he he said it was pretty close to right okay. what he, what the other surveyor said. So okay, well. and we're lo willing to live with that. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other quite. Oh, I'm sorry, Supervisor Holmes. Yeah, I have a question for staff. If uh, the Sorensons had applied for a building permit before they did any work, would a survey been required or be recommended? Uh, uh, no. Okay. Property owner is responsible for knowing where the property lines are, but that's not a requirement of pulling <coughs> a building permit or submitting for a building permit. Yeah, many of those surveys were done in the last century, and I know <coughs> I have three properties oh, that yeah. uh, I had a resurvey. That's right. You know, were surveyed recently. And then we had to make adjustments with the uh, other property owners, but uh, it was always always able to be worked out. So, but it's important to get a survey. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'll reserve the rest of the questions. Okay. I don't see any other questions for you at this time, so we may reserve the right. To Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. Why don't you just sit up front, and that way, if we have others, okay. as we hear public comment. Okay. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to this item? Yes, sir, go ahead and come up. How you doing? Hi. I'm John Matthew, his neighbor to the north. Before Sven, we were friends for 25 years. I've helped him do a lot of projects on his property. Um, I asked him to get a survey before he even started the project. Um, after that, we, um, I helped, I got him, a friend of mine that does construction, to build his wallet and a couple other projects for him. And I helped my friend uh, with the project, thinking that he knew where the, where the property line was. Evidently, he didn't. He should have had it surveyed, in my opinion. Um, they trumped up a harassment charge on me after the fact that the property was, he was building on my property. Um, the council turned him down twice and then he approached me about buying a piece of my property. Well, my brother-in-law just died recently so I didn't have a chance to get um, I, I called the, um, his surveyor a couple of times and we were going to plan on meeting out there. Um, I told the surveyor that what I wanted and uh, he was supposed to give it to uh, Sven because I really don't want any contact after this. Uh, they kind of put me through a lot of hardship and uh, so that's really all I have to say. Um, I'm willing to work with them about buying a piece of property, but uh, you know, I told them thirty thousand. I figured a thousand a foot for property in Placer County. I don't think that's not very, you know, that's reasonable. So, thank you for your time. Thank you, board members. Do you have any questions? So you're willing to sell the additional property to the Sevensons? Or the Sorensen. Sorensen's. <laughs> For what, $30,000 yes, to uh, take, make this pro problem go away? Yes, sir. And you'd be agreeable to that? Yes, sir. Okay. And then re the retaining wall, that still has to be addressed. The retaining yes, wall. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. Before you leave, yeah. I had a question for you. Sure. Um, I had suggested to the Sorensons after I visited the site um, that they look at a trade because it looks like your property is accessed access from down below your building in the future if you were to build on the site would be most likely down on the lower section of your property and not up at the upper part where this structure is I suggested it would you entertain a trade versus the cash because I uh, know everybody is in that situation that property down there is so steep it's really ha I have no use for it the top up the top part is kind of it yeah. So you'd build a driveway all the way up there? I already from, have. All the way up from the bottom? Yes. And does that PG&E power line create a impact on building? Um, I would build on the other side of it, but... Yeah, but, so away from their property, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, the building, if you've been out there, it's a pretty much of an eyesore for my property. But I'm willing to help them out and do that for them. Okay. okay. Supervisor Jones might have a question yeah. as well. I, I do have a couple of questions. So I, I know, I think you recommended that they get a permit to build. But survey. Or, okay. A survey before a they started building. Okay. But then you, you worked with the construction company that you know. Yes. And built without determining whether they had. Mr. Sorensen told me that he didn't need a survey. Okay, but then you did continue to build with the contractor. Well, yeah, I helped my friend out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, but when you continued, it didn't concern you at the time that that buttress was it, coming onto your property, or the it did when they put they built the main wall and then they put that wing wall on. That's when I got concerned because that intrudes onto my property. Right. Well, did you did you and the con contractor build that? that no, purchase? I was actually going to the doctor. I had some liver problems, so I was not on that. I was. Did, did your contractor friend build that part? Um, yes. Because I think it's it's a necessary part of that retaining wall, isn't that? I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Well, I won't assume anything then. Um, so anyway, um, so my question is. I know we had suggested that if you consider the property line like so, if you tilted it on its access like this, that would increase theirs by however many feet we need to get them away from the property line, and it would increase yours downhill. We all went up there and toured the property, mm -hmm. and I didn't really see a roadway up to the top of the hill. Well, I'm down on my part off of Bearview. Uh -huh. You go around that real sharp corner, and then my driveway comes up, excuse me, up from there, and then I have a, a flat spot there, and then I continue up, there's another flat spot, and then the road continues up, and it's a beautiful view up there from the, of the canyon, yeah. what well, used to be after the Now all the trees the burn. are burned down, you can't see yeah, something. Yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna grow back. Right, right. And so... Um, I'm not really interested in trading. So what is it that you're interested in? I... You just want them to tear it down. No, I don't. He doesn't... I, I gave him the option of buying that piece or whatever the county suggests. So I'm kind of curious. If you were to extrapolate... Um, the price that you want for that section of property, what would it come to as a price per acre? Uh, you know I've talked to a couple of real estate people and they said that the um, property in Placer County is blowing up, as you know, and that's kind of what the suggestion was from them. So I, I'm still curious if anybody can figure out what that extrapolates to being as a price per acre and what a price per acre is, you know, because it seems for a 30 foot swath of land, 30, 30 feet by how, how much? It's probably, um, the size of it is 30 feet, 30 feet off of this corner I went out, 30 feet off of this corner I went out, and then 30 feet out this way. So it's a yeah, kind of a half moon. Yeah, we saw, the, we saw the stakes, yes. we saw the stakes. Yes. 
So at any rate, so that's a concern for me. What does that what does that extrapolate out to as a price per acre, and whether that's a reasonable price? Because I nobody really knows right now. I have no idea. That, I, you know, like I said, I talked to a friend of mine that's a real estate agent. Yeah, that's what she told me. Okay. Um, so, but you've said in your letter that um, you want the structure removed because it uh, it's going to interfere with your property but again we were there and we see the property I mean the overhead wires where you're not going to be able to build very close to his property right so so I'm kind of wondering kind of why we're here because if you help them build it you help them build it in 2011 and did you help them build the shop? The contractor also helped build the no, shop? No. Okay. So then four years later, they built the shop in 2015. But then the first complaint was received in uh, 2018. <clears throat> and that was about the retaining wall. Adam, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that first complaint in 2018, is that by Mr. Matthew? Uh, no. No? Uh, no. Okay. So then um, the Sorensons applied for the permits in 2019, but then the uh, next complaint didn't come until July 2020, which is now, well, 15 years from the building the building and another four years, 19 years from building the retaining wall. Why did you wait 19 so years So I to had a survey done myself on that. Um, the, uh, the surveyor took a while to do that. I don't live on the property. Well, I w used to live down below, but the house burnt, my old property burnt. And uh, I didn't know at the time where the, you know, I, I kind of knew because there's a post up by the telephone pole and I could, you, you could tell it's a straight, pretty much straight line. And uh, that's how that went. It just, it just, it's curious to me though, why you waited that long to make the complaint. I didn't because know I, what. Yeah, I saw your property and I saw where you have some, um, I don't know, salvage material, I'll say. I, I, I'm a welder and a fabricator. So stuff you need. So, and I saw where you did some grading with your property down there. It looked a lot different before the fire. And then the tree guys came in and just made a mess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to get it cleaned up. So, so, but, but, so, so you participated in building this stuff. And I understand that you, you know, asked him to make sure he had the requirements that he needed. But then you took almost 19 years to complain about the retaining wall and such. And now it seems like by your letter that the only thing you're going to accept is either $30,000 for a piece of property or to tear, all, tear it all down. Well, I got with um, code enforcement a long time before that. It just took a long time for them to come out, check it out. It, I don't think it was 19 years before well, I started talking to code enforcement. These are the dates when they said the complaints were received, not resolved. Nine years. Nine years. Well, the first complaint was about the wall in 2018, and the wall was built in 2011. Okay, and then the second complaint came in, but you're saying that wasn't your complaint in 2018. Your complaint wasn't until 2020. I never, I contacted code enforcement. I never made a complaint. I just wanted. Well, that's what they do is they well, file okay. a complaint for yeah, your behalf. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, but yours was July 2020. 2020. And so that's quite a number of years after. So it's just, it's curious to me that you helped, maybe two you, years. you helped build and then, um, you know, and then after a while, it seems like it was after your falling out with them that then you came forward and contacted code enforcement. Um, yeah. Sure. And don't I think I understand you probably talked to a real estate agent, but to me, thirty thousand dollars is a lot because if we 
do not grant their variance, they're going to have to tear down everything that they built, the retaining wall, the building, and everything. And I'm going to imagine it's probably going to cost them somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty to fifty thousand dollars to get somebody out there to do that for them. Yeah. So here they are faced with they pay you thirty thousand dollars in order to gain compliance, or they pay thirty to fifty thousand dollars to tear their projects down. Either way, they're going to be out a big chunk of money. Everybody's supposed to go by the code. Well, I, I understand that. That's, I understand. You know, we have a lot of people in Placer County that don't go by the code. <laughs> I understand and, uh, that, but <laughs> so when you go, when you don't go by the code and you get caught, then you're backpedaling. Now I, they're, I now can they're see backpedaling, that. I can and see I have that. no. But I'm just it just it just kind of makes me wonder why you helped them build it and then you turned around and complained. We were best friends. So did that change they, they, why you complained? No. Oh. Well, after that, they um, they became really rude to me and and trumped up that harassment charge, which I would never hurt these people, no matter what. So after that, I did get a little mad. So. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. So very much. thank you, Ms. Kathy. Appreciate that. Are there any other members of the public that would like to address this uh, item? Uh, I just want to add that for the area that um, the Sorensons would need, it's approximately a 30 by 65 foot space. Mm -hmm. And at $30,000 per acre, that would come out to $653,400 per acre at that rate. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I don't know anybody here, but um, I think that rate of $30,000 is astronomical before I just heard what I heard. Um, and also, I thought if you have a structure and it's been seven years, you can just apply to get a, um, an easement through there. So it sounds like it was over seven years, and I may be incorrect on the law, but um, also if there is already an easement there with PG&E, I don't see how you can charge that such a top dollar because you couldn't do any kind of building right there anyways. So um, I, I, I feel like um, they, they've been trying to fix it, they, they started in the wrong without the survey, yes, but they did try to apply for many things to be in compliance, and it sounds like their neighbor isn't wanting to rectify it in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I, I am curious if there is a way that they could just apply for a permanent easement through there because it's been over seven years since the initial thing and without any complaint. Um, because I believe that's the law for building on somebody else's property. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other members of public here in the room. Are there anybody on, is there anybody online? Okay, then we're gonna close the public hearing on this item and I see our county council wants to offer some wisdom. Thank you. To the board, I think, <laughs> more than anyone. <laughs> I, I'm gonna bring this back to what this proceeding is. This proceeding is an appeal of the denial of a variance by the Planning Commission. I would caution the board to avoid discussions on what fair market value might be of property, because that's not what's in front of this board. Um, to Jennifer's question, I think what she's, what she's thinking of is prescriptive easement. That's a civil procedure. That's not in front of the board. What's strictly in front of the board is whether to uphold, which is staff's recommendation, to uphold the denial of the Planning Commission's denial of the variance, or to consider granting the variance. If the board wishes to grant the variance, the board is going to have to provide, on the record, for staff, findings to support the um, statutory requirements for the grant of a variance, and staff can put those up if you so desire. But I just want to bring this back to what we're dealing with here. Okay. I appreciate that wise counsel. Uh, and I think for, for at least for myself and, and I assume also for Supervisor Jones, when we have disputes 
as a board, we're trying to find the simplest way to resolve that without setting precedent. And I, I don't think we were trying to, in my mind, I wasn't trying to negotiate a real estate deal. I was just trying to suggest a compromise that might benefit both property owners and we could move forward. So, I, but I appreciate the guidance on that. Supervisor Gore? May I ask a question of staff? And that is, um, right now the building is at zero or three feet variance, right? It's right there at the property line. Um, but the board could give a variance of 10 feet, correct? I mean, we could give right, a it, even though it's supposed to be 30, right? Per code, there is a variance that could be at 10 feet, correct? Or less. Or less. Oh, yeah. it could be or less. Mm -hmm. All right. It could, but remember, the, the one portion of the retaining wall, which is on the, the neighbor's property, you cannot grant a variance for that. Mm -hmm. They would have so to take that portion take down, that which portion they're looking down. at doing. They yeah. need to address yeah. and take it off the other property line. I was just trying to get a sense of, right, 30 feet certainly isn't necessary if the board granted a variance. And then how much of a variance is the board allowed to grant? It sounds like it can be zero feet up to 30. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great. Any other board comments? Uh, go ahead with questions, sure. Yeah, the presentations are done. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of questions um, for staff. That I, I'm looking over the, um, the findings that have to be made. And it starts out with uh, buildable space buildable space on the property. So my question is, what is buildable space? Is it what part of the property is level enough to build on, or is buildable space uh, what we consider the property owner can build a retaining wall to create buildable space? Actually, let me jump in here, if I could. Um, it's not buildable space. Okay. It's special circumstances particular to the property that would merit the granting of a variance. So is there something in particular about the property, such as topography, is one thing, that would deny the property owner the privilege that would be, uh, would be realized by other property owners in a similar circumstance under identical zoning? Mm -hmm. Okay. So my question is, I noticed in, in the report here that, that the county calculated slope on this property and on another um, similar property, there was no calculation of slope. It just referred to that property as being, having a, a high slope. So I'm just curious, why are we assigning a grade to this sloping property but no grade to the other one? Uh, I wanted to include the slope on this one because there is a bit of a, a slippery slope. understanding <laughs> of what is uh, an extreme slope. At what point is it a, uh, a part that it makes it difficult to build on? And there isn't a, a firm de definition of what extreme slope is or what, uh, what portion of a slope makes it difficult to build. Um, and so in my presentation to the Planning Commission, I included some, some uh, diagrams that show what different slopes are, uh, but there really isn't in our code a specific uh, okay. percentage or description of what okay. slope has to be for it to be considered uh, a special circumstance. Okay, so after um, their property where they have made it flat to build on, what what do you consider how their property slopes off there in your opinion can they build on that or is it is the slope too steep i mean based on what you just told me the i'm not sure so, what the question well the is. argument the argument i won't say argument but your your explanation to the um planning commission when you spoke about the slope on their property after the flat part where it drops off what were you telling the Planning Commission? That because of that slope, it didn't make it feasible that they could move the building, or it is feasible that they could move the building? We, at that time, we made the case that it is feasible because a lot of similar properties in the area have similar slopes, and they've all developed and did not require to get variances for their 
uh, projects because they were able to create retaining walls that met the requirements for stepping so that they weren't uh, nine foot high retaining walls. They might be two um, five foot high retaining walls to get the same, um, the same slope and, and buildable area, well, flat area for oh. them to build on. Um, so a lot of other parcels in this area with similar sl slopes have been able to develop on site using the, the, the ordinance as it's written, mm -hmm. um, terracing and stepping their site so that they can have level areas to build on. And um, most of those parcels did not require variances or um, so we did not determine that to be a, a special circumstance in this situation. Okay. Okay, so of the land that they already have made flat for mm -hmm. building purposes, I know on your diagram it shows um, the septic system and you're saying that there's still room for them to move the building forward uh, without interfering, but I notice there's no measurements to determine the distance from the garage to that septic system or leach field. And we don't have those measurements. The way to get that firm would be to have a, uh, a leach field tracing done uh -huh. uh, because we don't have a way of confirming where those septic lines, those septic right. lines uh, right. as they were depicted on the site plan were drawn in by uh, Mr. Sorensen. And if we were unsure of where property lines are, we're probably unsure of where septic lines are uh, unless we receive a tracing or something that would really clarify right that. so then in essence we can't really say that it would be feasible for them to move that building forward without having a survey to determine whether there's any space between that building and the septic system sufficient space correct for that location but there are other locations on the property where he could where it is conceivable that he could have constructed but he'd still have to do more retaining walls and correct and back okay. and stuff okay yeah. i'm just not sure yeah. how reasonable i think you know that and that's just a, an opinion okay um, ej did you have a comment i saw your no, hand. I, I think the way uh, supervisor jones closed was just that i mean there's really no level flat area on site to build so no matter where you put a building pad it's going to result in cuts and fills a retaining wall it all has to be engineered so there's really no telling whether or not that's going to result in you know more significant impacts to the site or not uh, you know there is topography on site so that is one of the challenges of building on this property is there other way places to build uh, yes but you know that will result in more cuts fills engineering work to be done great thank you supervisor Holmes who paid for the survey And how much did that run? How much was that? Come up with it. Did you have a contract with yes. the surveyor? Yeah, I, I submitted it to the county. Okay. And how much was it? I think it was right around $1,000. $1,000. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any other comments from the board. Um, I will say that um, I think we can make the variance findings that we need to make um, for in this situation. It's not what I want to do. Um, as I expressed to the Sorensons, I think when we come in after the fact and try to rectify things, it's, it's never good. We'd much prefer people to come forward and follow the pro process and follow all the rules. But after visiting the site, I think there are circumstances with the topography, the size and shape of the property that justify this variance. I um, would like staff, um, it would be my suggestion that we direct staff to come back with those findings. And, um, and I don't find that the neighbor is going to be harmed by these. And that's a big factor in my decision um, that I look across the property and I see the PG&E transversing uh, the high um, high voltage line transversing that property and I don't see a building site there so I don't find that the neighbor is harmed I think in this circumstance it would be very challenging for them to relocate that shop to be accessible for use yes you could build it down the hill but you have to get down there and back up and and store materials and moving a septic system it would be extremely challenging as well in that area so 
I, I'd like to direct our staff, I'd like to continue this item. I believe that's what we need to do and direct staff to come back with those findings. If it is the desire of the board uh, to take tentative action, mm -hmm. the board may do that and then direct staff to bring back findings to support that tentative action. Uh, and I can walk you through that if that is the, the desire of the majority of the board to move forward. On. Okay, okay. Thank you, Karen. I was just getting my opinion out there on this. Okay, Supervisor Holmes. So you're suggesting that we grant the appeal for the setback of the shop, mm -hmm. but not for the retaining wall. Not for the part that's retaining encroaching. The they have to remove that. Okay, yeah. all right, just want to clarify that. Yeah, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Yeah. So the request is a zero foot uh, variance for the retaining wall. So the retaining wall would still be permitted all the way up to the end of the Sorensen's property. They would still have to remove the portion on the other side of the property, yes. but there would be a variance for the retaining wall um, to get it up to the property line. Mm -hmm. And would have to be engineered properly. It doesn't look to me like it's engineered properly, the one thing, existing retaining wall. Is it? Yeah, I mean, they would have to, you know, obtain their, you know, building permit final, which would require all engineering. Okay. And let's clarify here. Um, there are two variance requests, okay? There's a variance for the shop and there's a variance for the wall. So when the board is deliberating and, and providing either tentative action or direction to staff, we need to know that tentative action on both of those variances. And again, the portion of the wall that's over the property line has to go because under the building code, you can't build over a property line. Absolutely. Supervisor Jones? Yeah, the only other thing I was going to kind of make a point of, because one of the um, the finding says that the granting of this variance would constitute a grant of special privileges. But does that mean every variance that we grant in Placer County is a grant of special privileges? Because we grant a lot of variances in Placer County. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why this you know, would be different than us granting other variances. Well, I, I, I agree. We've made other findings in similar yeah. circumstances. Um, recently so yeah okay good I'm good okay so is there a motion oh. yes I'll, I'll make, I'll a, make motion. a motion if you'll help you yeah. okay so it sounds like <laughs> right, the consensus yeah. is we we're going for a tentative action to actually grant the appeal so I'm going to walk you through and we're going to take these um, individually uh, so the first would be a tentative action to grant the appeal filed by Sven Sorensen. I make, I make that motion. I'll second. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The next would be, and I, I'm assuming we are talking about bo both variances, so I'm going to lump the two together. And so your next tentative action would be to grant I need help from from EJ. Is it uh, we are going to grant both variances? Would that be the appropriate? Yes, yeah, so I would grant a uh, 3.74 foot setback to the allow the existing shot from the side property line. And then it would be a zero. A zero foot setback for a nine foot retaining wall on that side property line. Those are the north property lines. And that would be your tentative action? Yes. Council. So, do we want to move this to a date and time certain for the tentative well, action? We're not there yet. We're, so that was a motion. I'll second it. I did have a question on that. This only applies to what's there today. They can't further encroach. Right. Is that our understanding? Do we need to be explicit in that? I think you just were. <laughs> okay, uh, because I think what we're trying to do is make this correct, and, and I don't want to see the rest of the building or other things right. go on to the back, and not that they would do that, but maybe someone else who sometime buys this property would say, oh, well, we've got a variance to go to zero. And yeah, staff will articulate that when we bring it back okay. to the board. Okay, thank you. So there's a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And then the third. Uh, the third tentative action would be to find the project is statutorily exempt from uh, environmental review 
pursuant to Section 15270 of the California Environmental Quality Act and Section 18.36.010G of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance. Actually, uh, if I could, since we're taking tentative action, the, that CEQA exemption is for a disapproval of a project. If we're going to approve it, then uh, you, we'll hold off on the CEQA side and bring that back at the right. final action. So uh, then I'm assuming the uh, directions should, to staff should be to bring this back with findings to support the tentative action and CEQA uh, determination based on the tentative action, correct? So I move approval. Now the next no. question is whether we uh, continue this to a date and time certain, and I'm going to look at staff as to whether they're. Yeah, I think the clerk to... of the board has a date that will work. Yep, we can do it on August 23rd, 2022, at 10 a.m. Do I want to confirm with the applicant appellant on this? Okay. The appellant can be here at that Does day that need time. to be a motion then setting that time? Yes. Okay, so Supervisor Holmes? Yes, I move. Uh, that motion, okay. Second. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you for the time today. Appreciate your efforts. You can ask staff a question. We're concluded with the meeting. Yes. You'll have to talk to staff about this. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, that was our 1035 timed item. So uh, we're gonna go back to uh, department items. And the first one is number eight, uh, Community Development Resource Agency Amendment to Placer County Code Chapter 16. And this is resulting from thank Senate Bill 9. Thank you. Development Resource Agency. So the proposal before you today is an ordinance amending Placer County Code, uh, Chapter 16, uh, and it sets process and requirements for Senate Bill 9 lot splits. So I'm gonna quickly go over Senate Bill 9, and then I'll um, recap some of the changes that were made as a result of the May 24th board hearing. Um, so I'll dive right in. So Senate Bill 9 has two major components to it. First, it allows by right um, two primary dwellings on one parcel and allows parcels to be split into two. Uh, it's called an urban lot split by the bill. Um, this is allowed in all residential single family zoned parcels in urban areas uh, that's defined by the state. Um, so, as a result of these parcels, uh, we can require access to a right-of-way. Uh, we can require certain easements for public services and facilities. Um, however, we cannot require off-site improvements um, or right-of-way dedications. Um, we can require, however, conformance with objective health and safety requirements. So these are things such as sewer, water, access, those sorts of things. So I put some examples in. Um, the other part that we can require is that it has to be a 60-40 split or roughly proportional. Um, and so as a result, um, the parcels can't be uh, carved off. They have to be um, generally parcels of the same size. So where this applies in the county uh, is these two maps here. So West Placer and East Placer and the areas in yellow are those that are designated as urban areas by the state. Uh, they are based off of US Census urbanized area maps. Um, as you can see, most of these are in West Placer. Uh, the portion in East Placer, most of it is in the Tahoe Basin uh, area, uh, which is governed by TRPA and is subject to separate subdivision rules. Uh, so we did an analysis of how many parcels this would affect. Uh, there are about 13,000 parcels that are splittable um, according to the SB9 considerations, and a little under 600 are vacant. Uh, this obviously uh, does not preclude any 
conservation easements or other things that might inhibit uh, a parcel from splitting, but it is a number of parcels within our county. So what we're doing is we're creating a new section of code. Uh, this would be uh, titled an SB9 land division. Uh, and what it would do is set out a specific process because uh, it would have to be a staff level ministerial review. Um, what we would do is then point back to our objective standards that already exist within our county code under the minor land division section. Um, and these would be related to water, sewage, and right of way access. So the process would be is that we would intake a planning application. Um, it would be distributed by staff through our parcel review committee. They would come back with comments. Then it would be determined by the planning director whether or not that this um, meets the requirements of an SB9 lot split um, and all the objective county requirements. And then we would issue what's called a tentative parcel map. That would be the um, approval of the split. And then the, what they would do is go to an engineer. They would have a final parcel map application through our surveying division. And they would then split the lot and have two recorded APNs. So on May 24th, uh, we presented an initial draft of this ordinance. Uh, there was a robust discussion. Uh, one of the key pieces was uh, a desire for local property owners to be aware that an SB9 lot split was occurring. So we've added in a noticing requirement um, for that is typical of our typical noticing requirements, uh, 300 feet or expanding out to meet 30 properties. We've also added in language clarifying that violating the affidavit that's required to be recorded, stating that you will own or occupy at least one of the resulting parcels uh, for a period of three years is a mis misdemeanor consistent with Chapter 16. Um, and so that would be subject to uh, citation, fines, and other civil penalties. So what we are asking today is to introduce and waive an oral reading of the ordinance to amend Chapter 16. Uh, and then find the proposed amendments to be exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, um, in accordance with CEQA guidelines sections 1506B3 and 15268. Thank you, Devin. Appreciate the presentation. I think this is, is this the third time? Second time. Second time, okay. <laughs> uh, but a lot of briefings too, so I appreciate your efforts. Supervisor Jones. Good morning, how are you today? Doing pretty well. <clears throat> so I have <clears throat> just a couple of questions on your criteria. <clears throat> the one says um, the lot split cannot act in concert with adjacent parcels. What does that mean? So this would be if two individuals uh, were working together to split their properties. So let's say um, you had property A and property B, and let's say they were working with a company and that company was coordinating with them, that would be in concert. It's a very loose definition, though. OK, OK. Is that to try to discourage two um, adjacent parcels from splitting, or? I wouldn't characterize it as that. I would say it is to, the, the intention is of, of the legislation is to allow for a split. So if two adjoining property owners come to a decision to do that on their own, that's fine. It would be to uh, not allow for people to work around the Subdivision Map Act in order to create okay. a kind of lot split so of like other, 16 parcels. So in other words, a builder developer comes in and talks two property owners into splitting lots and so they can build. Correct. OK, OK, that, that makes complete sense. And then as far as the, um, if they do not live, if they violate their affidavit, and you said that that now constitutes a misdemeanor. How will, will we, the county, prosecute them, or? So it's handled by code compliance. So it would be a complaint and then handled through our typical code compliance process. With a fining process, fines, or what? Correct. That would be through fines, are we citation gonna, to correct. Are we going to amend our fine policy so it's more than $100? <laughs> It should be something that's going to sting, don't you think? I think that that would be something that would be considered um, 
uh, under a different item with our code okay. <laughs> our code group to, to consider yeah good amending as long as we're thinking about it <laughs> yeah open to suggestions um, I do want to mention though that I do have a constituent in my district who's already expressing concern because they live on a large parcel maybe two acres two three acres they have a multi-million dollar home and they just learned that their neighbor wants to split his property, build a duplex and a fourplex or something like this. So it's a grave concern because now naturally their concern is their property value is gonna decrease seriously. And they've mentioned to me that they're probably gonna be putting their house on the market. What, what process do we have for this other property owner in applying? I mean, you're saying that you're gonna notify um, 30 properties or you know adjacent properties so what's their recourse this homeowner I mean you're going to notify them and tell them it's happening but is it just for the sake of saying oh by the way this is happening or correct Cor it's just a noticing um, that it is happening it's a it's a oh. um, option that's allowed under state law and so they have so we just a, yeah as we uh, Devin had pointed out there are certain things that we can um, require as part of the split but what we can't do is preclude the split so that is right. um, so they, we are just noticing them of the action that's going okay. to be taken. Oh, well, I guess I'll expect some houses going up for sale in my district. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I know it's not your hands; it's the state's hands. But at any rate, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. Any other board questions or comments for Devin? Um, Devin, I think and you and staff have done a great job addressing our concerns that we brought forward previously and addressing those. So thank you. Appreciate the efforts to have some level of local control <laughs> measured as it is uh, in, the, in this situation. I think those changes are, are um, good for our constituents. So thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Not seeing anybody rushing up and no one on Zoom. Okay, uh, so we have two actions requested. We could accept one motion for both items. Do I have a motion? And I'll second. Thank you, Supervisor Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on then to items 8B, and same team is probably sticking with us for C as well, right, Alice? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. I'm Alice Atherton, Senior Civil Engineer with the Engineering and Survey Division of Community Development Resource Agency. I'm here today requesting the board one, let's see, I got my glasses here. Authorize the purchasing manager to award a contract to Ghirardelli Associates Incorporated of Roseville, California under an existing master services agreement, SCN 101518, to perform construction inspection services for the construction of the Bickford Ranch specific plan, phase 1A villages, LDR 3 and LDR 4 improvements in the amount of 527000 $230 and to execute contract change orders in an amount up to 10% of the contract amount, 52,500, or excuse me, $52,723. And two, approve construction and inspection services agreement number three with the constructing developer, Toll West Coast Limited Liability Corporation to fund both consultant construction inspection services and a portion of the county staff time for inspection to manage the contracts and authorize the Community Development Resource Agency Director or designee to execute the agreement and any amendments thereto. And three, a approve a fiscal year 2022-23 budget amendment number AM006704 CC06001 Engineering and Surveying in the amount of $527,230 with offsetting revenue provided by the constructing developer, Toll West Coast Limited Liability Corporation. So the Bifford Ranch specific plan is located south of Highway 193 and east of Sierra College Boulevard in the Penryn area. 
The specific plan at build out will create 1,890 residential lots. So the five improvement plans here today in this package are for LDR 3, LDR 4A, LDR 4B subdivisions, and together the, that includes 159 residential lots. The inspection related to the subdivisions generally involves underground sewer, water, storm drain, curb gutter sidewalk, pavement, the pavement striping, sound walls, landscaping, and street lights. And there are also two lift stations included in this package. The inspection generally involves all underground work, mechanical systems, pipes, wiring, instrumentation, masonry walls, and landscaping. Previously approved for this specific plan, and ongoing construction involves rough grading in the phase one area, off-site sewer, off-site water, the widening of Sierra College Boulevard and portions of Grand Ridge Drive and Bickford Ranch Road. And they're basically constructing the backbone and working from the western portion of the roadways over. And so now the packages before you are the subdivisions improvements that are beginning. So the actions request today will allow for a contract with a private consultant, which is Ghirardelli, to inspect the work and then an agreement between the county and the developer, which is Toll West Coast, for the developer to pay for the inspection and some county staff time associated with the project. And then the third item is a budget amendment with no impact to the general fund. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Board members, any questions on this item? I'm not seeing any. Is there any public comment on this item? Chair. Okay. There's a public comment. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Garabedian, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Mr. Garabedian, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Mr. Garabedian, can you give your comments? I am trying to give my comment. Thank oh. you. We can hear you now. Uh, thank you. Mike Garabedian, uh, Placer County tomorrow. Uh, Placer County has the highest con concentration of WUI, wildland urban interface, among all California counties. Bickford Ranch is one example of a development that could keep Placer County at or near the state's top WUI concentration for a long time. Bickford Ranch is on the crest of ridges, surrounded by ignition potential, great ignition potential. County even recently approved a development at the base of the hill below this development where I raised these issues. Um, the uh, a related question here is whether this development property was transferred from the Penryn Fire District to be in the county fire in order to capture the increased assessed valuation from the development. Um, and uh, approvals, uh, they may have potentially, uh, potential putting future residents in harm's way are, are at issue. Um, so this action is, if the county was involved in that changing of the uh, proper, this property to go to the county fire, it relate, raises interesting questions about the relationship of your actions now on this project uh, and in the past. The critical issue here, though, is that the county and the good steps you're taking, like earlier on the agenda and other agendas, to deal with fire are greatly overshadowed by the massive development you're approving in expanding the WUI space. And in fact, the question of minor divisions, which was mentioned in the last uh, item, is relevant here because the county does have the power when it give, approves a minor de develop, division of, what, four or fewer par parcels. It does have the power to prohibit further divisions of those. Now, does it ever? I've never seen it, even when recommended. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garabedian. Are there any other public comments? I see none, Chair. Okay. 
Um, we're talking about authorizing our purchasing manager to award a contract for construct master services agreement to perform construction inspection services and approve a construction inspection services agreement number three with the constructing developer and approve a budget amendment uh, in the amount of 527,230 with offsetting revenue. I'll move all three items. Thank you, Supervisor Gore and Jones. And it's a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wigan is absent. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Okay, and then we'll move on to item 8C or 7C. What? <laughs> yes. 8C, thank you. This, this item, we are requesting the board one to authorize the purchasing manager to award a contract to Ghirardelli Associates Incorporated of Roseville, California under an existing master services agreement, SCN 101518 to perform construction and inspection services for the construction of the Bickford Ranch specific plan, phase 1A villages LDR 19 and MDR 1 improvements in the amount of $955,495 and to execute contract change orders in an amount up to 10% of the contract amount, $95,550 and two, approve construction inspection services agreement number two with the constructing developer Bickford Improvement Company, Limited Liability Corporation, to fund both consultant construction inspection services and a portion of the county staff time for inspection to manage the contact, contracts and authorize the Community Development Resource Agency Director or designee to execute the agreement and any amendments thereto. And three, approve a fiscal year 2022-23 budget amendment number AM dash 00671 for CC 06001 engineering and surveying in the amount of $955,495 and offsetting revenue provided by the constructing developer, Bickford Improvement Company, Limited Liability Corporation. So again, this is very similar to my previous item, but this includes four improvement plans in this package. LDR 19 subdivision and MDR 1 subdivision together include 261 residential lots. There's one sewer lift station and there's a phase 1B south rough grading and the inspection involved in this rough grading is of roadways and 326 pads for approximately 800,000 cubic yards of earthwork, drainage facilities, retaining walls and erosion control. So LDR 19 is scheduled to be the first residential improvement plan to be constructed. So again, the actions today, it's uh, to request that we allow a contract with a private consulting firm, Ghirardelli Associates, to inspect the work in a payment agreement between the county and the developer, in this case, Bickford Improvement Company and this will allow for the developer to pay for the inspection services and county staff time associated with the project and a budget amendment with no impact to the general fund. And the only difference between this one and the other one is a different owner. This one's Bickford Improvement Company and the last one was uh, Toll, uh, Toll West, West Coast, excuse me. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Alice, appreciate it. Are there any questions, board members? Not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? Not seeing any. I'd entertain a motion for the three items. Thank you, Supervisors Gore and Holmes. And this is a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant absent. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on now to item 8E, Placer Legacy Use of Funds Agreement for the Placer Conservation Authority Red Wing Grant Funded Conservation Lands Acquisition. Yeah, good afternoon, Chair Gefferson and members of the board. Jennifer Bias with Planning Services here to talk about this item. Before you is approval of a Placer Legacy Use of Funding Agreement with the Placer Conservation Authority. With approval of this use and funding agreement, 
We also need to adjust funding. So we are asking for 445,000 in a budget amendment to move funding from the open space reserves into the open space funding for 2022-2023 fiscal year. And we're also asking that the funds be deposited into the escrow account for the Red Wing um, land acquisition. Approval of this agreement is the continuation of the Placer Legacies partnering with local, state, and federal funding to leverage private and public dollars towards conservation. This agreement will commit these funds um, from the Placer Legacy to can be combined with 5.2 million in federal and 1.3 million in state funding in order to purchase 560 acres of the Rioso Red Wing Ranch property, which is located in Sheraton. The property contains a variety of sensitive species and resources, including vernal pool wetlands, seasonal wetlands, and grassland. Participation in this agreement meets the goals and objectives of the Placer Le Legacy Program. Specific in this case, it preserves open space land within the county, protects sensitive resources and habitat, ensures natural resources will be preserved for future generations, and also this acquisition is critical to the success of the PCCP conservation strategy. So with that, myself and Greg McKenzie with the Placer County Conservation Authority are here to answer any questions about this agreement. Thank you, Jennifer, I appreciate it. Good to see you, Greg. Are there questions? I don't either. I know. This is really exciting. I do think that um, sometimes we take great pride in what we authorize uh, for new development, but when we are preserving these lands, you think about how much new development could have been requested of the board out in this area on these properties, and we should also be taking that credit um, because, as we heard from a couple of speakers, they just think we approve everything for more development. Here we are preserving some land and a uh, huge swath of land. So I think it's really exciting. Greg, did you want to say anything before we? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen. Greg McKenzie here today with my Placer Conservation Authority Board uh, Executive Director hat on. So here representing the authority. Um, as Jen mentioned, this has been quite some time in coming. When I started with the county in 2016, this was our first land acquisition I brought forward in close session to the board. So working on it for quite some time, things have obviously changed. The PCP has been approved, adopted, permitted, which gave us the ability to leverage additional state and federal funds. And so in this case, $445,000 of matching funds by my math is about 15 times leveraging into state and federal funding in the amount of about $6.5 million. So significant leveraging of legacy dollars, which is really how legacy is intended to work and provides opportunities like this to, to uh, conserve lands. And so these are all conservation funds coming out of the feds, the state, and now the county from a Placer legacy perspective. So. Uh, a really good win in terms of uh, leveraging those funds and a win for Placer Legacy from staff's perspective. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? Yes, Chair, we have one. Mr. Garabedian, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Mr. Garabedian, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, thank you. I think I'm. Uh, thank you. I think I'm. I think I'm unmuted now. Uh, yes, let me you turn are. off my phone. Um, I think it's important to uh, point out uh, a question of transparency about this action. Uh, this is one of the rare actions of the Placer Conservation Authority that actually gets aired in public. Nearly all of their actions, and that's dozens and dozens of them, are acted upon, uh, referred to the county and so forth, without any public input, uh, not even, for the large part, the uh, advisory uh, committee. So this is a, a serious problem, from my point of view, that uh, the 
applications or inquiries come in, come in. Some of them are found to be uh, not uh, applicable or needed for PCA action, but many, many others are, and the public has no say in, the, in them, no say in what the PCA is doing when it's taking its actions. There's no reason it couldn't. I mean, it's a joint powers agency. It could certainly put these items on what it's doing on its agenda and, and uh, inform the public, but it doesn't. The ones that do show up like this, I congratulate them for that, I'm not commenting on this project itself, however. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garabedian. No further public comment. Greg, would you like to address uh, anything that you just heard? Sure. Um, all items that are subject to the Placer Conservation Authority's authority go to the Placer Conservation Authority's board for approval. Um, I want to speculate as to the intent of Mr. Garabedian's comments, but I think they were directed towards actual land use entitlement approvals that come with the authority of the county and the city of Lincoln. So the PCA has no land use authority except for participating special entities that have to apply for coverage, uh, get approved by the state and federal agencies, and come to the PCA board for approval. Though all of those do come to the PCA board approval, uh, but with the exception of land use entitlement projects, the, that authority is held and vested with the county and the city of Lincoln, and the PCA uh, authority ends there. That was the intent of the formation agreement for the JPA and continues to this day. And Great. may I ask a question, yes. Greg? And Greg, so um, any agenda items that we have for the PCA are published, put on um, website, made available to um, the public at large for those who are interested, right? Um, right. And we've done a lot of outreach um, to make people aware, and I think we're gonna continue to do some more additional outreach on behalf of the PCA to make sure people are aware of some of the, the work that we're doing and have done. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for speaking to that. Uh, are there any other comments or questions, board members? Otherwise, um, I'd entertain a motion for the three actions that you see in our agenda. I'll second. Supervisor Holmes and Jones, and it's a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant absent. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson. Aye. Thank you. And let's just make sure we calculate how many homes aren't going to be built because of that action, right? It's an astounding number if you think about it. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on now to facilities management. Um, item 9A on our agenda. It's found on page 263 of our packet. Good afternoon, okay. Chair Gustafson and fellow supervisors. Um, I'm presenting the Thousand Sunset Roof Renewal Project and request the following two actions. Approve plans and specifications and authorize staff to solicit bids for the Placer County Thousand Sunset Building Roof Renewal Project. Project number uh, PJ01783. It's located at 1000 Sunset Boulevard in Rockland. And uh, the second action is to authorize the director of facilities management or designee to award and execute a construction and contract not to exceed $850,000 upon concurrence of county council and risk management, including authority to approve any necessary change orders not to exceed $55,000 consistent with county purchasing manual section 20142 of the public contract code. Um, so a little bit of background, the Placer County Thousand Sunset building roof is 13 years old and comprised of modified bitumen and some liquid applied membrane. Uh, due to the poor condition of the roof, the VFA building management software has identified this roof for full replacement. The building has had numerous and repeated water intrusion issues since Placer County ownership, uh, since Placer County took ownership in 2017. Uh, to mitigate these current and future issues and extend the useful life of the building, the roof system needs to be replaced. The design presented will add an estimate of 20 plus years to the roof's life cycle and address current issues such as poor drainage and dry rot. Um, with that, do you guys have any questions on, on this project? Uh, the only thing I would ask, because I wasn't on the board, was this identified when we acquired the property in 2017? That, do you know? Uh, not to my knowledge. The, the, when, when facilities management acquired the property, it did go through an inspection process. Um, there was some, I 
I can't tell you exactly what was found during that time. I was, I've only been with the county for a couple of years, but um, I can provide uh, to you guys the inspection report when we purchased it. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested only um, because I want to avoid this again, because if we already had roof problems in 2017 and it's 13 years old now, that roof was only seven or eight years old and, and right. none of us would want our home's roofs to only last that many years, let alone a, a commercial property or industrial property. So I'd be interested in that just to avoid um, a situation again where we acquire something and and haven't found or done the necessary inspections so yes and i and i can provide that report to you thank today. you i appreciate that mm -hmm. any other questions board members uh any public comment on this item i'm not seeing any i'd entertain a motion to uh take the two actions specified Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. And then, Charlie, you're back with us for item 9B, the Auburn Jail Generator Renewal Project. Yes, yes. So for the Auburn Jail, um, we're requesting the two uh, following actions, uh, approved plans and specifications and authorized staff to solicit bids for the County Auburn Jail Generator. And this is project uh, number PJ01. 1784 located at 2775 Richardson Drive in Auburn. And then the second item is to authorize the Director of Facilities Management or designee to award and execute a construction contract not to exceed $500,000 upon concurrence of County Council and Risk Management, including authority to approve any necessary change orders not to exceed 37,500 consistent with County Purchasing Manual and Section 20142 of the Public Contract Code. Um, and then background on this one is the uh, Plaster County Armored Jail Generator System Room 2 is more than 20 years old and is comprised of a diesel engine, a 500 gallon uh, diesel fuel convolt and exterior automatic transfer switch. Um, and due to the age and poor condition of the generator, the VFA building management software uh, has identified this system for replacement. The generator serves a critical function at the Auburn Jail to provide adequate lighting, cooling, heating and fire suppression. To mitigate uh, these current and future issues and improve the reliability of needed backup power, the generator needs to be replaced. Um, and then the design presented will add an estimated 20 plus years to the generator system. And I'll answer any questions if you have anything. Thank you, Charlie. Are there any questions for Charlie? I'm not seeing any here. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay, I accept a motion to take the two actions specified. Thank you, Supervisors Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate Thank you. it. Okay, we'll move on to item 10, Health and Human Services, uh, Mental Health Diversion Services, ratify in execution and submittal of an amendment to revenue agreement with the Department of State Hospitals Agreement. And I've spoken long enough that Amy should now be available. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, good morning, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. This is Amy Ellis with the Adult System of Care. Um, here to bring your board uh, action for consideration to ratify an execution and submittal of the amendment to the revenue agreement with the California Department of State Hospitals for mental health diversion services to increase funds by $900,000 for a new amount not to exceed $1,965,000 and extend the term an additional year for a new revised term of July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2024 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So over the past several years, the state of California has seen a drastic increase in referrals to state hospital of patients who are incompetent to stand trial. The state has allocated a portion of its budget to help fund county diversion programs in an attempt to decrease the amount of individuals uh, sent to state hospital, reduce jail population and expedite treatment, and decrease recidivism to the jail. In 2019, the Department of State Hospital awarded Placer County $1,065,000 to work with individuals with felony cases who are heading toward incompetent to stand trial. 
These case and cases often take a lot of court time and leave individuals in custody who could be receiving treatment in the community if deemed appropriate by the court team, which includes HHS. The purpose of this amendment is to add an additional $900,000 from Department of State Hospitals specifically for housing resources for diversion participants. This amendment also extends the end date of this contract by one year. Funds would increase options for housing for those served by this program and who are followed by the court. This could minimize time in custody, lead to better outcomes, and further minimize recidivism in the criminal justice system. The agreement is fully funded with state dollars and is included in the department's budget, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Amy. Board members, any questions? I'm not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? Entertain a motion. Goran Jones, all those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? None. Okay, thank you, Amy. And you. now we'll move on uh, to 10B, school-based mental wellness services. Twyla, are you, is she joining us? There she is. I am here. So good afternoon, Chair Gustafson, supervisors. Uh, Ms. Schwab, Ms. Uh, Christensen, uh, Christensen, Twyla Abrahamson, Director for the Children's System of Care, and I am pleased to be here to present this item. So the State Funded Mental Health Services Act, you know it as MHSA, has effectively created stronger partnerships between county and community services in Placer County since 2004, and they deliver services to the seriously mentally ill, as well as evidence-based pre prevention and early intervention programs, all without local county dollars. So Placer County Health and Human Services and Placer County Office of Education have had a long-standing history collaborating to address the mental health needs of children in our schools. This contract amendment to provide MHSA funded services was awarded to PCOE by your board on July 7, 2020 and include a multi-tiered system of supports aimed at increasing protective factors and providing early intervention strategies through appropriate school-based services to students and their families in the majority of our county's public schools. These services have included delivering community trainings around suicide prevention and early recognition, including applied suicide intervention skill called ASSIST, Safe Talk, another uh, education program, and mental health trainings. These trainings have historically relied on volunteers from the community who have dedicated numerous hours themselves to receive the required training to deliver these education and services. With increased workforce demands, securing available volunteers has proven to be an ongoing challenge. This additional funding, which is possible through increased MHSA revenues, provides an opportunity to have dedicated PCOSB staff be trained to deliver these programs moving forward, minimizing interruptions in service delivery and increasing capacity to meet the community's growing need for this critical education. So we're requesting your board take the following action. Approve an amendment with PCOE to provide school-based mental wellness services to increase funding by $140,856 for a to new total amount not to exceed $1,528,924 for July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 23. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign the amendment and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 with risk management and county council concurrence. And the increased amount of MHSA funds is in the department's budget. And of course, this is state funding, so no county general funds are required. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about this. Thank you, Twyla, appreciate it. Are there any questions, board members? Okay, any public comment on this item? again um, so my question is with these programs because it sounds very vague about what these programs are about um, are we doing programs to encourage children to vaccinate or have other procedures medical procedures done without consent of parents or knowledge of parents or is this strictly to identify some sort of violence in the home or depression or something like that 
um, because children are um, very susceptible to things and we've seen a lot of different things coming up in the media with um, gender issues as well as parents not being informed uh, for medical procedures being done on their children, children being coerced into doing things, and I'm just curious what these programs are going to be providing to the children in the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So to address the question, these programs um, have nothing to do with any of that. These are strictly for educators and people who work in the schools to be trained to identify signs and symptoms of mental health issues, depression, potential suicide, and for them to be able to talk about them, to be able to identify that those are issues going on, and to try to link uh, any of the youth to services out in the community or there in the schools themselves. Uh, if you can look up Safe Talk, which is one of them on there, and Mental Health Assist, which is also some of the educational programs, those are well covered uh, on the internet. You can take a look at what they are. They're evidence-based programs or promising practices. And again, these are strictly for mental wellness to ensure that children and youth are able to talk to someone, but also for the educators themselves to be able to identify the signs and symptoms. So these are for the train the trainer models is what they are for. Thank you, Twyla, appreciate that explanation. Are there any other public comments? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Holmes and Jones, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. And then we'll move on to uh, 10C. This is Medi-Cal Health Enrollment Navigators Project. Greg is here. And uh, sorry we've kept you so long today. <laughs> That's all right. So good afternoon, Chair Guff Gustafson and members of the board. I am Greg Geisler, Deputy Director of Health and Human Services for the Human Services Division. Here today to ask <clears throat> two actions be taken, um, both regarding our health care services uh, navigator uh, program. First is to ratify, uh, ratify approval. Sorry, that was left over. <laughs> Ratify approval and execution of the amendment with the California State Department of Health Services for the Medi-Cal Health Enrollment Navigators Project to extend the term an additional month uh, for a revised period of January 24, 2020 through September 30th, 2022 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services uh, to sign subsequent amendments consistent with the subject matter and scope of the work with risk management and county council concurrence. Second, to approve a resolution to ratify approval and submittal of the application with the California Department of Health Care Services for Medi-Cal Health Enrollment Navigators Project for the period of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2026 in an amount not to exceed $5,500,000 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to, uh, to execute the resulting agreement to accept additional related funds not to exceed $100,000 and to sign related amendments and documentation related to this funding consistent with the subject matter and scope of the work with risk management and county council concurrence. So the background, AB 74 authorized the California Department of Health Care Services to manage and fund a Medi-Cal outreach program. And that is something that we have been involved here in Placer County with um, since uh, 2020. It's uh, allowed us to do a number of things uh, in, as far as outreach is concerned, including um, working with our community-based organizations um, to, uh, to become application assisters, also to um, have uh, electronic uh, reminders put out to uh, applicants and Medi-Cal recipients, and uh, additionally for training for our staff to increase their ability to uh, do uh, Medi-Cal applications, those that are primarily in other programs. And it's also allowed us to do outreach um, with uh, some of our Health and Human Services uh, partners to some of the populations, special populations that we work with, including the disabled and the um, 
those with uh, substance abuse issues. Um, this extension will allow the balance of $1,686,038 to be spent over the Oh, the did I hit that? I'm sorry. I turned and my, uh, my chair arm hit it. So sorry. No, no, no problem. So the Department of Health Care Services has released an application to continue these programs through June 30th, 2026. And uh, Health and Human Services, through the Human Services Division, submitted an application in order to meet the July 5th, 2022 deadline. The application process to continue uh, programs in Placer County utilizing these uh, the community-based partners to meet the needs of Placer County re uh, residents. Uh, the agreement is funded with federal and state dollars and no county general fund dollars and it's included in the department's fiscal year 2021-22 and 22-23 budgets. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Greg. Are there any questions for Greg? Okay, any public comment on this item? We're not seeing any, so with that, I'd entertain a motion for the two actions. Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. We got to you a little before one. Up to item 11, human resources. Kate, thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Thanks for hearing this item right before lunch. Never an enviable position to be between an overworked board and their lunch break, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, at your last meeting, I'm sorry, I should have first introduced myself. I'm Kate Sampson with your Human Resources Department. At your last meeting, you'll recall that you uh, approved a new memorandum of understanding with your largest bargaining unit in the county, PPEO. And related to that item, today's agenda includes HR's recommendation for pay and benefit adjustments for your management and confidential units. Um, specifically, today's item targets Placer County's ability to recruit and retain top management talent in a really highly competitive labor market. Um, there are a number of reasons for um, the market environment right now, but we know that for decades, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has uh, predicted what they call the silver tsunami, meaning that as the baby boomer population retires, uh, there's simply just, it's a numbers game. There's not enough workers to replace all those positions. Um, this has been exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic and the great resignation. And so we find it increasingly difficult to be really compelling with our compensation package in the market, particularly as it relates to management positions where we're looking for highly experienced and talented individuals. So accordingly, staff recommends today uh, general wage increases be approved for managers over the next three years in the amounts of 4.5%, 4.5%, and 4%, respectively. Uh, the action items one and two before you would implement those wage increases for first elected department heads and then management staff. Um, these adjustments are critical to maintain acceptable salary differentials between managers and the staff they supervise. Again, hearkening back to your last meeting where you approved wage increases uh, for the bulk of county employees. Additionally, to that end, HR has identified two instances of salary compaction where a manager is not earning at least 8% more than their highest paid subordinate. So action item three before you introduces an ordinance adjusting the salary grades of the chief district attorney investigator and the deputy director of facilities management in order to maintain that minimum 8% salary differential. Apart from salaries, HR has conducted a review of our benefit packages and recommends some adjustments commensurate with uh, market standards and employee feedback, including an increase in the cafeteria plan amount for management and confidential, the addition of one floating holiday, an increase in the deferred compensation match and contribution rates, 
and an increase in the Tahoe branch assignment pay and auto allowance amounts. Um, action item four introduces an ordinance implementing those benefit changes for your confidential employees. And finally, action item five introduces an ordinance implementing compensation changes for management confidential um, employees, as well as updates to your code that reflect the terms of the MOU approved at your last meeting. If your board would be willing to entertain it, I do have one adjustment to propose to the last ordinance. If I can direct your attention to page 312 of your packet. This ordinance is amending the county code. This particular section relates to uniform allowance. And as you'll see, there's a, a list of various classification series. Uh, the first item on page 312 is Staff Services Analyst 1 slash 2. I'd like to amend that to include slash senior. So where it's bolded, staff services analyst one, two, and slash senior. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Similarly, about halfway down the page, you'll see deputy probation officer. Again, at the end, one, two, senior. I'd like to amend that to include slash supervising. As we looked to clean up these lists, those two classifications were unintentionally omitted. So I'd appreciate uh, your board's consideration of those changes. Okay. And that concludes my comments, but certainly open to any questions you might have. Okay. Board members, any questions or any comments, County Council, on making those changes? No, because this is an introduction, uh, we will include the changes with the introduction if the board so, so chooses. Okay. Uh, we do need individual motions on this one. Okay, great. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Any questions or comments, board members? Not seen any. Any public comment on this item? Okay, then as you heard, we need individual motions. Um, the first motion would be to introduce an uncodified ordinance, waive oral reading, implementing compensation adjustments for elected department heads. Okay, hold on one second. Supervisor Holmes made the motion? Yes. I'll, I'll go ahead and second and just say that it's really nice that we are in a position to be able to do this for um, our managing staff, department heads, um, folks have worked really hard. They do an excellent job. And I just want to make sure that they hear that. Yes, um, so absolutely. Happy to second that. Absolutely. Thank you. OK, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Then I'd entertain a motion to introduce an uncodified ordinance, waive oral reading, implementing compensation adjustments for classified and unclassified management employees, including appointed department heads. Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And then I would entertain a motion to introduce an uncodified ordinance, waive oral reading, amending the schedule of classifications and compensation ordinance related to salary compaction in the district attorney and facilities management departments. Mm -hmm. Second. Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And then uh, entertain a motion to introduce an uncodified ordinance, waive oral reading, implementing benefit adjustments for confidential employees. Second. Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, and then on number five, we need to read something into the record, I believe. No, I would just like it if the motion clarifies. I think the Karen's ready to do that, I think. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, sorry, Megan. <laughs> so uh, the, the final one is introduce a codified ordinance, uh, waive partial oral reading, amending various sections of Placer County Code Chapter 3 to implement compensation adjustments for unrepresented and Placer public employees, organizations, employees, amending as stated into the record the changes to Section 3.12.1 
020. Holmes and Gore, all those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Kate, and thank you to all our staff that are well deserving of these adjustments. Okay, now the last people between us and lunch, Public Works. <laughs> and, and closed and, session. And, I know. <laughs> we have a long closed session, and then we have to do some other business. But, Robin, we're going to let you talk about sewer maintenance districts. Okay, I'll make this quick. Okay. All right, uh, good afternoon. Chair, members of the board, Robin Mahoney again with DPW. Um, today, staff is asking that your board approve a fiscal year 2022-23 budget amendment to increase sewer maintenance district one enterprise fund budget in the amount of $2,652,245 for American Rescue Plan Act funding to finance the Lincoln Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant Reclamation Facility Aeration Project and Maturation Pond Lining Invoices. Uh, for background, City of Lincoln and Placer County entered into the Construction Operations and Joint Exercise of Powers Agreement to plan, construct, and operate a project converting wastewater treatment plant in North Auburn into a pump station, install a pipeline from North Auburn to the wastewater treatment plant in the City of Lincoln, and increase pa the capacity of that now regional wastewater treatment plant to accommodate county sewer flow from the SMD1 customers in North Auburn. The aeration project is proposing to rehabilitate two aeration basins at the regional wastewater treatment plant in Lincoln, replacing aged aeration equipment at the end of its useful life. Through the retrofit process, the new equipment will utilize more efficient technology. On May 24th, 2022, this board authorized this payment and approved the aeration project funding agreement with the city. The county has since received the first invoice from the city and in order to process payment of this invoice as well as subsequent invoices that are forthcoming, a budget amendment is required to increase the spending authority of SMD1. So with that, I have, uh, will I answer any questions? Okay, thank you, Robin. Any questions? Comments? Um, Bonnie? Yes, comments. Supervisor Gore? I know that we've already approved this, but I, I just wanted to say thank you to our board for looking at um, funding this. Uh, Supervisor Holmes and I have been sitting on the joint task force with representatives of the City of Lincoln as we're addressing the Lincoln uh, wastewater treatment plant, the expansion, the need of that, and, and this will certainly benefit our residents in SMD1 um, and, and the Lincoln residents as well, making sure that those sewer operations um, continue and can meet the demand. And I, I just really appreciate the fact that we're able to partner with our cities in different ways um, to make sure we can continue to meet the needs of our residents. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? We're not seeing any. Uh, this is a roll call. Well, I need a motion first. Gore and Jones, and then this is a roll call. Gore. Aye. Wigan absent. Holmes. Jones. Gustafson. Aye. Okay. We are now going to, thank you, Robin. Thank you. We are now going to go into closed session. County Council, um, if you could also give us an estimate of time uh, when we'll be back to, because we have a 1.30 timed item. So we'd like to put that on public record if we think we might need a little more time. Um, yes, the board will now adjourn to closed session to consider one item of real property negotiations, uh, one item of public employment, one item of existing litigation, and nine potential cases under anticipated litigation. It's estimated that once the board is seated and ready to consider closed session, it's going to take at least an hour if we take all items now. Uh, what would be the board's pleasure? We try to get back by 130 or 145 if we're not done. I would like to try to since we do have a timed item. So we'll, we'll try to be back shortly after 1.30, and then we may have to break again for closed session, Karen. Thank you.
Good afternoon. We have returned from part of our closed session. County Council will give you a report now. The board met in closed session to consider the following. Under conference with real property negotiators, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote, Wygant absent. Under uh, public employment recruitment process, the board heard a report, no action requested or taken. Under potential um, anticipated litigation, potential exposure to litigation, the board heard the first potential case. They heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote, why again absent. On the second potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote, why again absent. On the third and fourth potential cases, the board heard a report on each. No action requested or taken on either of those. That concludes this portion of closed session report out. Thank you, Karen. And we will be going back into closed session um, after this next item, which is was our 1.30 timed item. We apologize uh, for being a bit late to return. Um, this is uh, an appeal of Planning Commission's denial of the Giarita variance. And this is found on page 77 of our packet. Hi, Callie. Well, good afternoon, Supervisors and Chair Gustafson. My name is Callie Kedinger Cecil with the Planning Services Division. The item before you today is an appeal, uh, is an appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of a variance. More specifically, the purpose of today's hearing is to is to consider an appeal from the property owner Mark Jurita uh, regarding a denial of the Planning Commission's. Sorry, regarding a decision of the Planning Commission's denial of a variance to allow an existing 729 square foot structure to remain in its current location zero feet from the edge of easement when a setback of 50 feet from the edge of easement is normally required. The project site is located at 1562 Dusty Road in the Cape Horn area of Colfax. It is northeast of the city limits and is developed with single family residential uses. The site is owned farm, combining minimum building site of 100,000 square feet and a planned development of 0.4 dwelling units per acre. Parcels to the north and east are, and west are under the same zoning designation, and parcels to the south are zoned residential forest, combining minimum building site of 80 acres. Here we have the uh, photo of the 5.1 acre project site. It is developed with a modular home, a roadway, uh, landscaping as well as the pump house. The pump house location is shown in red as well as the easement that crosses through the property. The easement is 60 feet wide and the pump house is zero feet from the edge of the easement. These images were extracted from the site plan that was submitted with the application materials and they show the location of the structures in relation to the road easement. So here we have the modular home and here we have the uh, structure that is the subject of today's item. So for a little background here, the appellant has a long history of constructing features and then obtaining uh, permits after the fact, uh, including from 2003 to 2006. Uh, there was a variance process to allow a home to be located 15 feet from the edge of easement where a setback of 50 feet was normally acquired, required. Uh, that variance was considered and ultimately denied by the Board of Supervisors. In 2007, the appellant addressed outstanding code enforcement violations and received approval of a variance that allowed the modular home to remain 17 feet from the edge of easement where a setback of 50 feet is normally required. In 2019, the county received a code enforcement complaint regarding a structure that was built without permits and within a setback. Uh, the pump house was originally 80 square feet and was expanded nearly eight times its size to 729 square feet. As noted before, it is located zero feet from the edge of easement where a setback of 50 feet from the edge of easement is normally required. On January 22nd, 2022, the zoning administrator considered the variance request to allow the unpermitted structure to remain and ultimately denied the variance request. On March 10th, 2022, the zoning, administra the zoning administrator <clears throat> decision uh, was heard um, at the Planning Commission and the Planning Commission upheld the Zoning Administrator denial after considering testimony from staff, uh, neighbors who opposed the project, as well as the appellant. 
So these and the following photos show the existing conditions of the structure. The red line uh, demarcates approximately where the original 80-foot well house uh, was located, and then it, it was expanded. So these photos show the exterior. This is, again, where the original pump house was, and then there's a, a wall that connects this to another shop feature over here. These photos show the location of the structure in relation to the road. Here we have the road easement, and the pump house is right up here. Section 17.54.140 of the Placer County Zoning Ordinance uh, establishes an exception to setbacks for uh, structures, including pump houses, that are less than 120 square feet. So when the um, when the structure was expanded, it was at that point when it went beyond 120 square feet that it would have required a building permit as well as would have been required to adhere to structural setbacks. On this slide and the following slide are the variance findings. When a variance is being considered, um, the granting authority must find that there are circumstances applicable to the property um, based on size, shape, topography, and surroundings. Um, whether or not um, those circumstances limit the property's ability to adhere to development standards, that the variance would not result in a special privilege or allow a use that is otherwise not allowed in the zone district, and that the request is a minimum departure from the standards. So this is just to provide some context to what the required findings are for a variance when one is being considered. So on March 21st, 2022, the appellant uh, submitted another appeal of the Planning Commission's decision, and that appeal asserted the following points. The first was that the appellant did not realize that he, the building location would require a variance. The second point raised by the appellant is that he is willing to do whatever is necessary to make everyone happy. His third point is that because the building is above the road, travel on the roadway would not be hindered, and therefore, the variance should be granted. Staff has prepared responses to the appeal and notes that um, had the applicant reached out and asked if a building permit would have been required, he would have been informed that a variance would have been needed to allow that structure within its location. Uh, the property owner has been provided with two potential pathways for compliance, which include relocating the structure such that it is entirely outside of the structural setback, or removing the portion of the structure that has been added such that it is less than 120 square feet and therefore would not be required to adhere to setbacks. The appellant has indicated to staff that he is not willing to do either voluntarily. Lastly, um, the location of a structure in relation to a roadway is not the primary consideration when reviewing a variance. As demonstrated in the previous two slides, there are a number of considerations that are required to be made to take an action of approval on a variance. The Zoning Administrator and the Planning Commission both determined that these findings could not be made and ultimately denied the variance request. Before I get into the recommended action, I would like to note that prior to, to today's hearing, we did receive two letters um, from a neighboring property owner. The first was received on July 5th, 2022, and the second letter was received on July 11th, 2022. The first letter is focused on the history of the property from 2003 to 2009, including the variance request for the location of the home and concerns with grading that occurred during that same time period, including allegations of importing fill from other construction projects in the area. The letter includes photos of the site and correspondence from the county. The neighbor's main concern with the present variance request is that the property owner has a demonstrated history of erecting features without permits. The letter notes that the APN appears to be different on previous applications and staff would like to clarify that the APN of the subject property as well as the adjacent surrounding properties were changed in 2008. Uh, APNs changed for a number of reasons and it appears the appellate has referred to the old APN on some of the application materials. A second piece of correspondence from the same neighbor was received, as I noted, and this includes a copy of the notice of violation dated March 5th, 2020 sections of county code regarding code compliance and enforcement, and a statement that the road is public but privately maintained. Staff has confirmed that the road easement is private. The note on the parcel map that created the three parcels uh, has a note that states area K is pertinent to parcels A, B, and C for roadway, 
and public utility purposes. The utilities are public and the roadway itself is private. The appellant also submitted co correspondence identifying another road easement that is on the property. So with that, staff forwards the Planning Commission's recommendations that your board take the following actions. The first is to deny the appeal filed by Mark Jurita. The second is to uphold the Planning Commission, Commission's decision to deny uh, the appeal of the Zoning Administration's denial of the variance <clears throat> and uphold that decision. And then three, find that the project is statutorily exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to section 15270 of CEQA and section 18.36.010G of the Placer County Environmental Re Review Ordinance for projects which are disapproved. With that, I conclude my presentation and I'm available if you have any questions. We also have staff from CAL FIRE and Engineering and Surveying available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Great presentation and good background for us all. Board members, are there any factual questions at this time for the staff? If not, then I would like to ask the appellant to come up and address the board. And I don't know if I said your name right. Giarita? Yeah. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. Well, I don't deny that I've done stuff, done stuff without permission in the past. And there's some other things we want to build, and I wasn't straightforward with my wife either because she had asked me early on, "Do you need one for that?" And so I did not. So I'm not denying that. But um, on the original variance, when it was granted, uh, I think it was Alex at the time was the one of the planners that was helping because they weren't going to grant it. And then he came up with a great idea for the, the whole fence and the planter area out front. And that uh, made a line for the new zero, uh, or I guess where the edge of the easement was. And so we still maintain that. And that was kind of our, uh, what we were asked to do is maintain the tree area and that uh, fence line to delineate that. And as you saw in the pictures, the road drops off at that point and the pump house and the whole house pad is sitting up uh, above. And I think we, part of the thing that we, I'd like to submit a couple pictures if I may. may bring yes, them up. if you give them to the board this clerk. This one's uh, the first one, it's just, and that's a, an okay shed, but it's right next to the road on one of my neighbors. And here's a pump house on a permanent foundation. So they're similar like right, right a couple doors down from my house. And uh, so it's not like we're asking for something that's way out of the ballpark. And my question, part of her pre presentation, I can't remember how she worded it. Uh, Callie said that uh, that they didn't agree with it, but when I, after code enforcement had me come in and I asked for, you know, got the building thing going and trying to comply with everything. Um, planning was on board, building department was on board, and uh, they didn't tell me at a, or then they told me about the variance. So, but uh, the first report when we went to the variance hearing, uh, they said all departments were on board with it and it looks good. Kind of different, that was a little different take than what you just heard from Cali. So, and I don't know how that got changed up over time. Anyways, and also here's one more picture of a, a structure. It's a garage right on our fence line, five feet from the fence line, right? on our property line, uh, Steve Gilbert's shop. It was already there when he moved in. He's a recent owner, moved in, I think, within the last three to five years. Anyway, so what we're asking for isn't, I don't believe, is beyond, yes, first of all, I did it without permission. But everything's engineered, and it's all uh, apparently from the first finding of the planning and building department, they were on board until the zoning administrator denied it. Also, something that wasn't brought up, we were requesting a, a generator pad because PG&E has been so crazy and we have some uh, high-risk family that's living with us. My brother has a broken neck, so we need an uh, oxygen machine and the breathing thing. Anyway, so we need electricity, so we, it's been really tough on us to get generators and keep all that equipment going, refrigerators and freezers, so we're trying to install a generator there by the propane tank. and so. Uh, and that's just outside of the, below the pump house. I don't know if there was a picture, but I had asked for the plant, one of the planners to come out and 
she wasn't available, so she sent an assistant out to kind of look and just see the lay of the land and see what was going on. Agre I'm in total agreement I was wrong, and I don't ever want to <laughs> go outside again because, we, like I said, we have some other, we have a deck we want to build and jacuzzi and some other things, and we're going to get it all, do it all right. And so I have nothing to say other than I'm guilty on that. But I would request, humbly request, that you would genuinely consider. I know it's a hard thing because you guys have to take serious what the planning, well, what the variance uh, administrator said and what the planning commission, because those guys, you know, they're very respectable. But I would just uh, ask you for grace for this because we're not encroaching any further on the, and the, the line that was demarcated was Alex approached me and said, would this work for you? And I said, yes. He said, I will pose it to the Board of Supervisors at that time, which is different than y'all now. Anyways, and so I stayed within that line, not that that's an excuse or a, so I didn't go any further out into the road is what I'm saying. So, and uh, anyways, and then one of the things my neighbors, and I, I believe in the good neighbor pro policy and we haven't been the greatest neighbors, I guess, because a lot of them have been upset. So we put some gates, they're not locked, and you all have pictures of it. I'm gonna give you this one too. This uh, come into our property because on MapQuest or whatever, it shows that our road connects to uh, Robbers Ravine, which is the next ro road over on the ravine. We've had a lot of traffic in there. One guy got stuck, I had to pull him out. Those are liability issues. So, uh, and my neighbors, are concerned that I'm hindering them from what used to be an access because this was raw land when we first got it and they had access to a point out further on Mr. Back's property and there was a road out there but it wasn't on our property it goes on a young man in our neighborhood just bought the seven acres next to us and so in the picture you can see I'm standing at the beginning this concrete here is the beginning and our property line there and I'm pointing towards what, what is the road that they're concerned about but it's not even in the easement so, and there's a bigger picture of it. Anyways, that road remains, but it's, it's on uh, Aaron's property. So to get out to the place that they'd wanted to, so I'm just giving you all that because it was brought up. Um, but I put the gates there, so hopefully with no trespassing signs, because the road actually doesn't even go through. So, and I had put in a road and I had it surveyed that is actually in the easement and it delineates so Mr. Back could get to his property. We cut in a fire break because my wife's been really freaked out. We've had, matter of fact, that in 03 when we bought the property, there was a, the Stevens fire and it was really gruesome. So that's been a real nail biter. So we want to make sure that we, and we're going to take out some more trees and we're going to use that material on our property to build this other stuff that we're going to get a permit for. So, yeah. Um, so anyways, I, I, I don't want to be a renegade and I have done things wrong, but I would just ask that you would uh, kindly consider, um, oh, and also when, I guess it was Sophie when she was there, mm -hmm. the assistant, mm -hmm. uh, we, I showed her another spot that could, could have been maybe, but it was over by Mr. Gilbert's house in kind of in his thing over there. It was, and it wasn't, it didn't have a 30 foot setback. So uh, I would just request, oh, that was the other thing. So the pump house, I had to take off part of it to do what I did now, and that's, that's not the full 700. There's like a tool shed, then the pump house, which I made a little bigger, and I was just gonna put a, a cover over it just to keep out of the weather so my wife and grandkids could do projects. So that's the whole 729 when the building department came out or when we figured it out at the counter. So that, that's what they're saying, so I didn't, make the pump house the 729 it's just once you connect it with the wall connects it now and i was going to put a roof over it so i didn't just blow the pump house up into that and that has our pressure tank and the electrical for the pump and stuff so thank you i appreciate the explanation um board members do you have any questions for mr giarita i'm not seeing any we may call you back up if we do. Whatever you need. Okay. Um, this is a public hearing, and so I open it up now to any public comments on this item. If any of you present would like to come up and share your comments.
Good afternoon, Honorable Board. My name is Vernon Barnes. I live 347 feet away from the Geo area property, and I have lived there since 1998. Uh, over the years, I've witnessed amazing amounts of debris, asphalt, concrete, uh, and other unknown stuff being delivered to that property from what turned out being the Colfax High School project, uh, a on-ramp, an off-ramp in Grass Valley. It was a Caltrans project. Uh, what I did see coming out of these trucks, besides all the dust and noise and everything boiling out, was big, giant chunks of concrete and asphalt. Uh, at the time, I called the county to ask them about the legality of this and basically was told that, well, you can file a complaint if you like, but we're so busy it'll be months before we get out there and I'm sure they'll be done doing whatever they're doing and that this is somewhat customary. Anyway, I would like to thank you guys and the staff for eliminating another nuisance property in our neighborhood that was just abated a few weeks ago. Thank you so much. We can sleep a little better at night. I appreciate that. Uh, the purpose of our local government uh, is also, you know, to enforce codes, rules, laws. After all, isn't that what they're for, our safety? Um, when we have a property owner that continues for now 17 years not obeying the rules, not going along with, you know, uh, nothing has ever been inspected prior to its construction on that property including the grading, which is the biggest issue. The grading has diverted the water, and it is actually affecting other properties, as well as the North Fork of the American River. Um, I'm about out here, so I'm going <laughs> to... Today we're here to fix another nuisance property issue. The Giaritas have never had inspections done on any work for grading on up. They have blocked the public road. That Cal Fire uh, inspector actually told me that would prevent them from going back farther to stop a fire should it happen, which the last one came from that direction, uh, that it would stop them because of the illegal fencing that he's put up, gates and signs. Um, I ask you two questions. Are you loyal to your duty? And if you agree with the decisions of both the zoning and the planning departments, how long before corrective action will be taken? As with the history of this project, it has been 16 years since this body, Board of Supervisors, uh, last decision of denial was September 22nd, of 2006. No action has ever been taken by the county. Uh, I came in here to bring evidence to the clerk of the, of the board. This was a couple of weeks ago. And I pointed to the picture of the five of you on the wall out there. And I made the statement to her then, I really want to trust these people. I really hope I can trust these people. You guys have already proven that I can once. Please find <laughs> the way to fix this one. I know <clears throat> I seem like, uh, you know, we, we retired here, we purchased here because we love the quality of life here. We're being surrounded right now by these other nuisance issues. And our choice is now that we're retired, uh, we don't have any ability to leave, go anywhere else. We don't want to. We just want our neighborhood back. 
You know, we just want it the way it's been, you know? And uh, anyway, I could talk about this for hours. I've taken enough of your time. Um, I just asked that you would be neutral in your decision as the experience with some county staff has not been that way. And uh, this is all about equal protection under the law. I mean, shouldn't we all be treated equally uh, with respect to the laws, the codes, and so forth? Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address this item? Please come forward, and then we also have somebody on Zoom. I'm Rick Martin. I live on Hideout, Colfax. Uh, Forty years ago, I was an owner-builder, and I had to jump through all the hoops. I had to submit plans. I had to have them checked. I had to pay for them. I had them inspected. I've been finaled. I think that should stand for everybody. Uh, and if... Uh, also, you said that, you know, he'd be willing to do anything. He could move. Did you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bad public speaker. So. That's okay. You did fine. Is there anyone else who would like to address this item? Sir? No? Okay. Who's on Zoom? Steve, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Steve, are you able to unmute your mic? Am I there? I'm yes. trying. Yes, I okay. can hear you. All righty. Well, there's been so much repeated ill will and bad faith going on here. And I look, you know, I look for you guys to uh, provide the authority or the guidance to do the right thing under the laws. And all I've done is bring those laws to, to you to see and make a decision neutrally and just understand that uh, there's no place else for us to go with this and I can't continue to get away with doing something wrong. I mean, he Mark since then already filed retaliatory complaints against other people. It's just, you know, he He's back, uh, back to my first complaint, a bad steward of the land. I did make a report when he's out grinding with sparks going everywhere when he was building this structure. And this structure is bigger. It goes absolutely out to the line, which he states it doesn't. It did. We've got aerial photos, and I can prove it. It was like eight by eight. And now I don't know what size it is, but it goes all the way out to the street. And by doing this, he's just taken one or two pieces of wood and crossed between those two things. And that's going to make two or three or four of his other illegal buildings a legal entity. He had me come over when I first moved there to help me put gutters on a shed so he could get a better loan. I mean, this is just repeated, underhanded and I, I have plenty of written evidence, you know, and, and I know we don't have time for all that. I'm sorry. I fell off a roof Saturday and broke my pelvis, so I'm in the hospital right now. But anyway, I had plenty to be there about. I just don't have it with me, you know. But uh, I, I believe, you know, I, I, I have faith that uh, with the evidence you've been shown and if anyone wants to look for any more, that you will uh, just deny it because you, it was denied in 2006 and nothing's been done. So this has just carried on and on and on. Um, I, I, I don't know what else to do at this point, you know, besides ask, do the proper thing and ask you to, you know, handle it, take care of this for us. We're, we're, we're not able, you know, we don't have the right to you know, enforce laws that we didn't make. Well, I've got enough personal out. That's that's it. Just I, I believe the facts stand where they stand. 
You know, I'm losing property because of his illegal grading. I've been, to, I've complained. No, this, this is the closest thing I've had to action, and this was my very first complaint. I complained on twelve sixteen about the grading. I got a call last week from Estelle that, uh, oh, I forgot to submit that. So, I mean, I don't know what else to do besides follow, you know, what I'm being told to follow. Okay, thank you, Steve, and, and we wish you a speedy recovery. But thanks for joining us and providing testimony. Are there any other public comments before we close the public hearing on this item? Uh, I, is that okay if he comes back okay. up? Sure. I was just checking with county council. I want to make sure I follow procedure. <laughs> I mean, I'm not taking this lightly. This is serious. And when, when I'm just sitting there listening to it, if I didn't know my own background and where I'm at, I would say, whoa, Nelly, I'd probably agree with these people. But one of the issues, and Mr. Barnes has been an operating engineer and a very reputable man for 41 years. He gave that testimony at the planning commission, I believe it was, or the zoning, whatever, it was either one. But, and it's interesting that he poses the grading violation. The very first work we had done without a permit, and I, I told the person that we didn't have it yet, was Mr. Barnes. We rented a dozer with our money and paid him cash to cut in the first road and the first pad. And so I just find that a little hypocritical. I know this all sounds damning, but and I'm, we love these people. We still consider them neighbors and friends. But I mean, for y'all to hear what he said, I'm like, yeah, that sounds bad. But the hypocrisy of it all, when he was did it for cash and he knew better, and yet he says, I can't believe this is going on and uphold the law. So I mean, uh, I don't know. Anyways, I thought that might be a little piece of nugget there. Thank you. Okay, last chance for any public comment on this item. I don't want to get into this, but okay. I saw the head shaking, so we'll take it at that. Okay, so we'll close the public hearing. Staff, do you want to respond to any of the comments we heard, um, especially as it relates to uh, the issues from 2006 and any grading issues, other issues, any clarifications you want to provide the board? Yes, thank you. Uh, the, the thing that I wanted to note, um, sorry, just looking over my notes. So re regarding the first uh, variance hearing, staff did recommend approval. Um, initially, my thinking was that based on the topography as well as the uh, heavily vegetated nature of, of the site, there were some circumstances. However, the zoning administrator ultimately disagreed, which is his uh, prerogative to do so. The zoning administrator, in addition to the planning commission and your board, in addition to my testimony, takes into consideration testimony from the applicant. In this case, it's the appellant, as well as public comment. So my recommendation um, was uh, ultimately disagreed with at the first go, which is, you know, that happens. Um, and ultimately, the zoning administrator denied that variance. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note um, regarding the um, activities that occurred between uh, 2003 and 2006, there were code enforcement activities that occurred, um, primarily regarding the modular home that had been placed on the site without permits. Um, the uh, property owner was instructed that he could not come back for a variance until he had resolved those code enforcement complaints, which did occur. And in 2007, the variance for the location of the modular home was ultimately approved by the zoning administrator. Um, if you have questions regarding the uh, grading issues, I do have my colleague, Eric Griffin here from the Engineering and Surveying Division, if you have specific questions to that. Um, other than that, that is the only clarifications that I wanted to provide, but I am available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Callie, appreciate that. Okay, board members. Any questions you have for staff? I guess I'll kick it off. Okay. Hi, Supervisor Kelly, Jones. Um, I, I'm still not understanding. How is it that we um, denied his request for a variance in 2006, and then a year later, the variance for his home was approved? Mm -hmm. 
In uh, two, or in the original decision where it was denied, um, it was denied because there were other code enforcement violations that were occurring in addition to the home. There was a fence that was located in the setback and then there was grading issues. So um, the uh, property owner was instructed that he needed to resolve those issues before he could come back. Um, at that point, the um, applicant demonstrated that he had resolved those issues and had also done improvements in order to, to demarcate where exactly that easement was in order to um, really identify where the easement was located. So. Um, it was approved because the applicant was able to demonstrate that he resolved those outstanding code enforcement issues and it was um, considered that there were some limitations on the site due to size, shape and topography and surroundings, primarily due to the topography of the site as well as the vegetated nature of the site. So I'm, I'm wondering on the variance history that you gave us. Um, it says that in 2003, the application for a variance was submitted um, to allow the, the home 15, uh, 15 foot front uh, setback and where, where it's normally required 50 feet. Then it goes on to say that at the time of the request, construction had already been completed and it was discovered the home was constructed in contradiction to a site plan approved with a building permit, which showed the home in the location that met the required setbacks. So I'm just concerned that there was a little, I don't know what else to call it other than deception when you've got the plan, you show your improvement plan, your site plan, and then yet you build it completely out of compliance with that. It's, it's in the history here in the board docs. So, I'm not understanding why we approved that. So it, it was approved by the zoning administrator because at that time, once the um, appellant had resolved the outstanding code enforcement issues, um, he was able to submit an application for a variance. At that time, staff recommended approval of the variance to allow the home to remain in its location and the zoning administrator determined that he was able to make those findings and ultimately approved it. Do you know what the zone, the uh, code enforcement issues were? It, it wasn't actually what you're stated here that it was not built according to the plan and did not meet the required setbacks. It, it was that, um, the, the, the original code enforcement complaints were also related to grading um, as well as a fence. I think the important thing to note though is that today we are here regarding the pump house. Uh -huh. um, and so I fully understand and I'm happy to explain this history, but the variance request today is for the pump house. Okay. okay, so now in 2007, I see, okay, I'm following you here. Yeah. Okay, I've got more questions besides that one there. Let's go back. So you talked about the, well, let me, let me go to, to the, what the uh, zoning administrator and the planning commission, they both denied this current request. That's correct. Because it didn't meet the setbacks and because they enlarged the property and then encroached on the, on the, the property line. That's correct. Primarily they were not able to make the findings required for a variance. So as I included in here. When a hearing body is considering a variance, uh -huh. there are um, criteria that are set forth. Right. And the zoning administrator and the planning commission determined that they were not able to make these findings. Um, primarily, whether or not it's a minimum departure, um, which is uh, F, because a zero foot setback is not a minimum departure from a 50 foot setback. Right. And also, um, the zoning administrator, when rendering his decision, noted that he was not able to make finding B uh, regarding that this would not be a special privilege and also that um, that it would deprive the, well, no, sorry. Kelly, let me ask yeah. you another question. Um, was he required to get a building permit to enlarge this? 
He is required to get a billing per permit for that, yes. Did he get one? He submitted one after the code enforcement uh, complaint was received. And when um, the front counter was reviewing the uh, building permit, they noticed that the structure was zero feet from the edge of easement or a setback at 50 feet is required. At that point, the building permit was um, you know, stopped, it, it was held. Uh, was, it, was it requested after the building was built? Yes, it was it after the fact building permit. The did structure it? had already been built. Uh, the neighbors submitted a code enforcement complaint. Well, did the building permit come with a site plan? Uh, it did come with a site plan, yes. And, and it, it showed it? Right up next to the easement. It showed it right being up to the property line? Yes. So is it that time that we said, is that why we're here now, because of that? Because of that and because of the code enforcement action. Be okay. Because there was a code enforcement complaint that was submitted. Mr. Jurita submitted the building permit to resolve the issue. And it was that process that daylighted the fact that it was within the easement. Oh, so the building permit wasn't even um, applied for until after the complaint. That's correct. That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, board members, any questions? Uh, the only question I would have is uh, Mr. Giretta, uh, Rita uh, provided us some other photos. As I understand it, the well house was okay because it was less than 120 square feet. It could be in that uh, zero setback. That was okay, and that would be okay for anyone else who had a, a well house uh, in that setback. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it really is. Uh, about this ex expansion of that structure that we're dealing with today. I just want to make sure that's clear because the photos do look uh, problematic, but if those are less, I don't know the square footage of those properties, but that's, again, not his. I'm talking about his, the photos he gave oh. us about neighbors' issues, but, again, that could be. Okay. Can I? Yes, go ahead. So the um, pump house was built... Um, right at the edge of the easement, correct, where it should have had a setback. But there is an easement. No, no, the pump house was okay where it was. Where, well. For the size it was. For the size it was. Yes. Okay, so it was fine where it was. That's correct. And then it, it got expanded, which was what the problem was. Um, but any type of additional building on that site, if you were going to have a, an additional permanent structure, would need to be... Um, Permitted. Would that be, is that correct? Depending on the size of it? Oh, I'm sorry, did I hit that again? <laughs> sorry. By the board. <laughs> you know, the arm of this chair hits yeah. that button. Sorry. Um, so in, in general, yes. However, there are some circumstances where, you know, a, a certain structure may require let's say, for example, an electric permit. Um, in general, however, structures that do not require an electric permit or any kind of water connections, just a straight building permit, less than 120 square feet, does not require a building permit, nor would it require adherence to structural setbacks. But once the structure was expanded beyond 120 square feet, it's at that point that a building permit would have been required. Was the pump house built at the same time the original structure was built on the property? I believe so. Um, I, I can only assume such based on aerials. Okay, yeah, well, that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, you know, just given the variance history, there was certainly knowledge here that variances were required to be within that 50 square feet for other types of structures that they had previously applied for. So, yes. you know, it's pretty clear to me there should have been knowledge um, that um, they needed this variance, they needed approval, and they needed a building permit. Um, and he's admitted he should have, and he screwed up. The question is what we do with this. Um, in my mind, I'm, I don't find this a compelling reason to, um, to grant this appeal, and I would uphold. That, that's my, my perspective. Supervisor Holmes? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've been to the site, um, and I looked, you know, checked it out very carefully. I've gone through the board packet twice, and what I see here is a pattern of behavior, and I think I can't support uh, granting the appeal on that, that basis. So. 
that's basically what I was going to say is uh, there's a pattern of practice developing here of not uh, seeking the proper um, documents and, and such that would reveal when you're building something or enlarging something and you know you're going towards the property line anyone should know to inquire whether that's okay to encroach on a property line instead of you know build first ask later and I know if there's future building to be done, I'm not confident that shown this pattern of practice that things will change if we grant this variance. Okay. Um, Kelly, will you put up the slide with the uh, recommended actions? So does anyone want to make a motion uh, for these recommended actions? Yes, Madam Chair, if you mm -hmm. allow me. Yes, well, I'm sorry, we have to do each one individually, so. Okay. Um, item number one, I uh, move that we deny the appeal followed by Mark Arietta. Do I have a second? I will second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, item number two, I move that we uphold the Planning Commission's decision and deny the appeal of the Zoning Administrator's denial of the variance. I'll second. Holmes and Gore. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? And three. And three. Fine. I move that we find the project is statutorily statutorily exempt from environmental review pursuant to section 15270 of the California Environmental Quality Act and section 18.36.010G of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, I'm glad to um, find resolution here for everybody. I hope we we'll work together to solve some problems in the neighborhood. Okay, with that, um, we conclude our open session today. We do need to go back into closed session for a few items. Uh, and County Council, do you want to make that announcement again? Do we need to? Yes. Okay. The board will now adjourn to closed session again to consider one item of existing litigation and five items under anticipated litigation.
No, we're never bored. That was just all the fun. He missed the two heaped up heels. He missed all the fun. Yeah, one would think he did it on purpose. <laughs> Thank you. The board is returned from closed session. Uh, County Council will provide a report. The board met in closed session to consider the following. Under existing litigation, Boyle versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote, Wygant absent. Under anticipated litigation, potential exposure to litigation, on the first item, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote, Wygan absent. On the second item, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote, at Wygan absent. On the third item, the board heard a report, no action requested nor taken. On the fourth item, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-0 vote, Wygan absent. On the final item, potential case under anticipated litigation, the board heard a report no action requested or taken. That concludes the report out of closed session. Thank you very much, and we will stand adjourned. Thank you.